Rafael Medina, thank you for coming on the show. Really appreciate it. Um, for those that don't know, or again, did not bother to read the episode description <laughs> for whatever reason, <laughs> yeah. like if you just somehow yeah. got here, but like, didn't read anything. Yeah, you didn't read anything. <laughs> like, play. you just press play. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Keep doing that. That's yeah, great. That's yeah, great for course, me. Man. Do what yeah, you gotta do. do that. But but also, if you didn't read the episode description, Raphael, can you just give the elevator pitch <laughs> of who you are and, and what you do? Cool. Um, so I'm a <clears throat> I'm a photographer from Providence, Rhode Island. Um, most people are familiar with my street photography work because that's like the thing that I'm you know mostly do. Um, but I'm also a concert photographer from out here. I do a lot of events in that area, so I'm pretty you know I'm pretty involved in the community right now. So. That's like the quick pitch, but it's I, I am a photographer, you know. So, so speaking of that, uh, you know, I always try to kind of move the story in a certain way with the questions. This one maybe will bounce them around a little bit, but yeah, I think course. a good start is what was the first camera you remember picking up? You know, what whether you were just messing around, whether you know whether you were really into photography. What was the first camera? And what was like? What was some of the first things you were shooting, and why? So. I might never. I don't remember the first camera I picked up, but I remember the first camera that made me feel like, oh shit, this is kind of cool. Like you know what I mean? So it's like there's this. Um, it's called the Canon T3i. So f- I mean, forever ago, forever ago. Um, my sister's ex-husband out in Colorado. <clears throat> I went to visit her, and he was like, oh, I bought this new camera. And at the time, I've never done anything except for like take like BS photos, like you know, at the house with my on my dad's camera or something. And then I um I before like, going oh, into that, can you talk about the quote unquote BS photos on your dad's oh, camera? So, like, <clears throat> so when I say photos, I didn't take photos at all. So it wasn't uh, like, yeah, oh, yeah, I didn't have okay, any okay, okay. My, my okay. father had a camera, and then it's like for for example, like let's say he wants to take a family photo, and he asks me to take it. You know what I mean? That's like the only uh, thing. But I, there, there okay. was never like a creative point where I'm just like, oh, I could I could see something like this. So like, so was, the idea of like just like. <clears throat> Doing just taking them. photos and enjoying it, and like that's like your thing, did not come until this story that you're about to tell. Okay, no, just, it, I just it, wanted to it clarify come that. Into like years after this gotcha. story that I'm about to. Oh, tell. okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All because right. Because when I first picked that up, I think that might have been, uh, might have been like over 15, 16, 17 years ago, and I um I just thought it was cool, and then I was really happy and excited. I was like, oh, how cool it is that he has his camera, and then when I got when I got back in the relationship that I was at the time. For Christmas, I guess she surprised me with, a, with that same camera. So it was like I was like, "Oh shit, this is oh. this was amazing!" Like I was like really amazed by it. And then I um I used it for, and I don't know what to do because like I didn't have the confidence to even attempt anything because I always thought my insecurities was kind of what always eat me alive before I would ever think that I can attempt something. So like it wasn't like, "Oh, I'm gonna try to be a photographer." It was like, "Oh, cool, I have this camera now. Let's see what I'm gonna do." And then. I didn't know anything. I didn't know setting. I didn't know shit. I just would walk around. Um, when I was with my family, we're going to go to, to like an event. I'll like bring my camera until it became too cumbersome to like hold with me. And then I just stopped using it for like years, years. So, yeah, because I was, I was going to say <clears> that <throat> particular model of camera is like, it's not like just like a point and shoot you could fit in your pocket. That's like a that's thing a that, camera. like that's a big camera that has <laughs> like a grip that like yeah, yeah. you can, that you have to, you buy lenses for. I, like, that, man. I don't know. I kept the same, the same lens that it came with. I knew nothing. About but, but that's what I'm saying. It, it's yeah, like a yeah, camera, yeah. like 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 yeah, yeah. if you're walking around with that, you like, can see that from a mile away. Yeah. Okay. Hundred percent. Yeah. 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 That was that was a fr- and it's funny because when I started doing photography, which was maybe six seven years after that, um, that was the camera that I would use because it's the only thing that I had. And then like I I shot a con- I shot one concert with the camera, and then I did a few street photography, did a, a few like sessions at the time with that camera, and then at some point like within a year, I was like, oh, I need to get something else, and then. But it was like because I didn't know, I just I didn't you know I just you kind of just do the best of what you have, which I still think you should still be doing you know to this day. So you're saying that like you had the camera, but you didn't know what to do with it, and you 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 put it down essentially. I put it down for years because I just I was too. It felt I felt too much. I just didn't know what I didn't know what I would do with the camera. You know? Now I, I know this was years ago, so we don't have the you know the convenience of I'm gonna go on YouTube and learn how to yeah, do this yeah. thing did not exist. But um, I also didn't have that confidence. So like even if I could have seen myself even YouTube. You know, there's certain things that I could just see myself like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to try. I'm not going to try. Like, trying was like a big thing for me mentally. So, Not to play uh, armchair psychiatrist here, <laughs> but um, was there anything, like, related to you not trying from, like, just a, like a regular stance? Was there something that happened where it's like, because there, I mean, I've, I've heard the story sometimes on the show, not all the time, but sometimes on the show where it's mm-hmm. like, Creativity in a household was not discouraged, but it wasn't pushed because there there's like a stigma of it not making money or anything. So, yeah. and I don't want to make any assumptions, but no, was there 
Was there any like reasoning, even from a creative standpoint, or regular standpoint, where like trying was just hard for you? Uh, it was more. It was all internal because I think that if I wanted to try something, my family would have been really supportive. I also have. Okay, a, that's good. I also have like a. My family's like from my mom's side. There's like uh, there's a lot of musicians from my mom's side. Like one of the, oh, okay. one of the biggest artists in Dominican Republic is like his family to us. Like my mom was raised with him. He's he's just he's always been around, and we know my uncle's been a musician and an artist his whole life. So it's like, but I just never, I just uh, because I think it was just that fear of trying with me. I, I feel like all it was all internal. So it's like I just wouldn't if I would want to do something, I would think, man, it would be cool to do that. Like I wouldn't think, oh, I should just do that. Like I would just always think think about it a little bit differently. Now also before getting into when you picked it back up again, mm -hmm. I guess why not seek out and I, and I want to dive into this a little bit further because yeah, yeah. I think it's a bigger, broader topic, mm -hmm. but just to kind of like get at the top of the iceberg here, why not, I don't seek out a photography class. Like, cause I know like mm -hmm. even like I went to a technical school and one of our electives was a photography. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with like, like I was learning network, it had nothing to do with it, but it was yeah, kind of yeah. cool just to like know Try the basics something. of stuff, like <clears throat> how, like how to, you know, like rule of thirds and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Like, yeah, yeah. Um, so like, why not seek that out? Or even in, uh, you know, I'm not going to make assumptions about if you were in high school at the time or whatever, but like, mm -hmm. why not see, you know what I mean? Like, why and not seek course. it out? I mean, from an outsider, it's like, what are you talking about? There's yeah, yeah. so many ways to do this, you know? So I completely understand. I just didn't, I didn't view life that way. So I, that's why I think everything's perspective. I didn't see it. I, because it was always my insecurities that would kind of hold me back. Like I would think, I just wouldn't think that I could do something because I was too fearful of, of like failing and failing to me was like okay. the, the biggest thing in my life. Like I would think of. You know, even in high school when, like, you know, if there's, like, a tryout for the basketball team. Like, I want, let's say I wanted to meet my friends who play basketball all the time. I wouldn't do it because I'm like, man, what if I fail? I can't fail. Like, I don't want to. I was just too afraid of failing. So, like, every time I would think of wanting to do something, I would think the fact that failing was a possibility, I'm not even going to try that because I'm not. That's not who I am. Like, once, once you box yourself in in something, I think it's hard to, it's hard to get out of it because you keep, making, gotcha. you keep making excuses to yourself why you can't do something you know what i mean but but then like i know mm -hmm. I, I put it this way i mean um i've i've dropped this a little bit on the show mm -hmm. but the show's not about me but yeah, just I, uh, man, but it is about I, I've, I've no it's, it's not it's about you it's about you god damn it it's about the guests not about me it's about the guests and the relatable you know what i'm saying like yeah. you have your experiences but too so it's as like, somebody <laughs> who's like had like mental health issues and stuff it like i can i can definitely empathize with that because then it, it, you are in like a it's like a weird feedback loop you can't get out of you, you literally it's just like <clears> that feeds into the thing and it just like keeps going on and in you, and on and in you itself. keep making an excuse every time like for example if i'm if i'm insecure about something and somebody could come up to me and be like look i was in your shoes before i know exactly what you're going through i did a b and c and luckily at this moment i got better this isn't that i would because I was so insecure, I would think, "Oh, you, you're just different than me. Like you just you just don't have it as bad as I do." Or, or, so, or like, like would, "Oh, you're an exception." Or like, any, or, or, yeah, or, yeah, or yeah, anytime yeah. you succeed, it's like, "Oh, that was lucky." And then the minute you fail, you're like, "Oh, see, I knew that yeah, was gonna happen." It's like man. So it's some like, self fulfilling to, prophecy weirdness. To, to me, it just didn't think you know. And I also there was a lot of growing that I needed to do um, in order to kind of get to the point where I was fine with the reality of like tackling something like this. So I had to go through so many stages in my life. What had to change and luckily my friends things that i embraced you know experiences that i had that changed me and allowed me to just kind of start working on myself and it's not until you start working on yourself that you that i was it wasn't until i started working on myself that i was ever able to get to where i'm at today so it's like without that without those years of putting in the work and all that stuff then that's the only reason why i'm here today you know what i mean well i think this leads into my next question so picking it up again was it one singular like thing where you're like oh, okay i need to i need to get back into this or was it like a series of things that kind of like pointed me in that like led up to it you mm -hmm. know what i mean was it like one event or was it just kind of like a driving thing where it's like oh these little things built up because yeah, i think yeah. both can happen to people. like you'll yeah, hear about yeah. like one moment can change your life but oh, also course, like right. make up if you make a bunch of small changes and in, incremental is. like you know it, it, and, you and can you do have, it either way you have to be prepared for that one moment like you have to be prepared. Like if one moment is going to change your life, I kind of feel like you have to put in the work leading up to that moment in a sense. So I, it's not, it's not like if I never did anything and then that moment came, like if I never did anything and that in a certain moment like that came, I could have never seen it because I could have just like been like, Oh no, like kind of just been negative about right, it. Right. But it's like, luckily I put in the work that once these opportunities presented itself, it's like, oh, okay, you have to, you have to do something for yourself. You know what I mean? So with that being said, was it one moment or <clears throat> was it a bill or in your opinion, or was it a build up of you picking it up? Oh, back no, it was again? a build up of everything. I think a build up of just me, discovering myself a little bit more um being more free more more open with myself going out more doing more things trying things getting to the point where i'm like all right i need to start working on myself i want to start feeling a little bit better 
like, you know, um, especially like, I, you know, when I first started going out in the beginning was with Jabron and Jabron's always been fucking fashion. Sure. You know, Jabron is oh, Jabron. 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 <laughs> Jabron. Jabron. Jabron's yeah. a, a great friend and yeah. also uh, has been on the show. Yeah. Um, yeah, and yeah, if, yeah, yeah. It's a really good episode. Yeah. And uh, there's no video. Unfortunately, I only started doing video now. I wish I did video. I mean, yeah. I have to have him to do another uh, follow up episode or something. But yeah, um, he loved doing it. He told me about but, it. But no, Jabron, you're great. If you're hearing this, you're you're awesome. <laughs> and um. Yeah, uh, anybody who's listening, go go check out that. Listen to this episode first because it's gonna be weird if you like go check out his <laughs> episode. Like, and come we back just here. This episode because like, this isn't going anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Like I'm, <laughs> I feel like I'm creating like the the freaking Providence Cinematic Universe over yeah, here. Yeah, like I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, referencing other things. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm dropping those <laughs> dropping those breadcrumbs, everybody. Yeah. Those Easter eggs. Yeah. But um, so yeah, you get you surround yourself with people. Yeah, and, and I think that's big. That like want to see you do well, and then you're yeah. like, okay, I need to pick this up. Again. And and I also think friends like. You know, I started partying, like, let's say this, something small. Like, I started going to, like, parties and stuff back in, in my um, senior year of high school. And that was, like, a big deal for me because I was, you know, I never used to do that. But I found friends that we ended up kind of just finding, like, our own little groove to it. And then, like, it was to go from a kid who's, like, more closed off to, like, start, like, flourishing and going out. It gives you, like, a different perspective on life. So it's, like, and that was just, like, the early stages. You know, I had to get to the point that even even when I think of that, it still was it's still, like, you know, 12 years before I even 12 plus before I even tackled it because I didn't think you know I once again I just had to change the way I thought about things and once I got to a point I got to a point back in like 2016 2017 where I felt that I've been working on myself for so much and I feel my life has changed so much that I just like started seeing like everybody as a peer like I started seeing like people that I thought were like up there you know <clears throat> Oh, like, like, oh, I'm not them. I'm not part of this I'm not crowd. Part of this, oh, I'm not yeah, part of this yeah. clique. So it's just like, but I, I learned that it was just, I learned that you just, you're just, you just do it. Like, you just have to do it. Like, you're either doing it or you're not doing it. There's no in between. So it's like, I, I, I remember, you know, I remember being younger, making fun of, like, to myself, you know, we're, we're young. I remember being younger, making fun of people because they're attempting something, not knowing that I'm making fun of them because of my own insecurities. I'm making fun of them to myself, like, in a sense of, like, you're just kind of like an insecure kid. Which is just, where you see that even now on social media where people are like, oh, try hard. I'm like, so you're making fun of somebody for actually like putting themselves out there and yeah. trying and something. It's, it's like, it's what like, have you been doing of then? Course, like, but it's like, I've, like, because I've been there before, I understand this. So I don't take offense to it to that degree. Like if somebody comes at me and I think it's more internal, like I'm going to approach you differently than somebody who I think that, that I think holds more weight and you're trying to come at me to embarrass me or something like that. But if I think it's internal, I'm going to, I'm going to treat you a little bit differently when you, if you approach me or something like that. And it's, um, but I, you know, I had to get to that point where I just learned that, you're either doing something or you're not. And everybody, everybody's a regular person in a sense. My favorite celebrity was just a regular person. They, he or she just happened to do something that got them to A, B, and C. And it's like, once I learned that, I just started seeing like, oh, I'm, cap I'm literally capable of anything. You know what I mean? So before getting into the picking it back up again, because mm -hmm. um, I think a couple of things you were saying brings up like an interesting sidebar question. And this is something I've noticed in my own experience mm -hmm. of being a DJ, which is like, I like being a DJ because um the life of the party but also people notice when i dj like not that i'm the life of the party but like i'm kind of the life of the party and not the life of the party yeah of course like that's why i don't talk when i dj because i'm yeah, like it's yeah. again it's not i'm like it's not about me it's like it's about making y'all party and y'all mm -hmm. star do you think that and because i just want to get your opinion on this do you think that that there's kind of the same thing happening in photography where it's like you're at a party and people are partying and then like people want their picture taken but mm -hmm. like people notice you but also like they like they notice you and don't at the same yeah, time yeah, like like and, and and like the reason why i bring that up because like for me as a dj like there's a weird comfort in like i'm um, being paid attention to you but only in a certain way a certain not really you know course, what i mean like so i'm wondering like is there a comfort in that for you where you have the camera and it's just kind of like you're there but also you're kind of like removed from it as yeah. well uh there's a huge comfort in that i think just be i i feel like i'm I've like in, I'm enjoying events more if I have my camera on me sometimes depending on the event because I like I think before I used to even when I used to go like to bigger events like let's say like stay silent events yeah as much as I go to them now also shout out to oh, I mean I'm gonna be interrupting you them. a lot they're, with, they're with like with <laughs> one a huge inspiration I think every seeing everything that they've been doing since early you know since early on um but even like but like let's say like their events like their like, when I used to go to their events before, I always felt extremely uncomfortable. Like, I never used to, like, whenever I used to go to their events, it would be once in a blue. Like, I think before I started, I think, like, I've been to Daytro a few times before, but I've never had as much fun as a Daytro until I started shooting Daytro. You know what I mean? Because I'm, to me, it was like, and at that time, too, back then, like, I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't, I don't think I, I was drinking at that time. So, like, whenever I would go to their events, I'm just, like, there, just, like, chilling. I didn't know them like that. Like, so, like, I didn't, I knew Jay because me and Jay worked together at Expressions. 
but like I didn't know I didn't know them like that personally and then like they all to me always seemed like artists and I always felt like I wasn't one so like I always felt like you know kind of like an outsider so like that's why even when I started doing it I always felt like an outsider but it but I you know I learned that it's all like in my mind it's all mental but it's like but I enjoy being at those events with the camera because people are just excited oh take a photo of me or they some people might just not want a photo either I've gotten that a lot so I'm going to ask some questions about that later because yeah, there's there's some there's like <clears throat> legal things that I think people don't realize too when it comes to photos especially when you do like street style photography that mm-hmm. I've always been curious about mm-hmm. um, but going back to the picking it up again so you stuck with that camera when you picked it up again did you just you know what was that process like did you just start shooting everything mm-hmm. did you start studying like how to use the camera first did you start shooting first and then like you eventually learn how to use it correctly because i think there's a couple ways did you take a class like yeah, yeah I understand. you know what i mean there's like so many different ways to go about it um so how did you go about like not just picking it up again but also oh like this is how to like this is how to get this result like mm-hmm. this is this is like what you know aperture settings are like this is why this lens does this and why this lens looks different than that like how did you go about that stuff as well that took forever to learn. Okay. <laughs> forever. Like I felt like I felt like I took a full year before I started kind of getting comfortable with It's not forever. That's pretty short if a so full year. So, so. <laughs> but here's the thing, like when you're if you're constantly shooting and you just feel so lost when you can't even get the basic I'm talking about just like the basics ISO aperture, you know what I mean? So it's like when it's like that in the shutter speed, like so was it more like shoot first, learn later? I not not try- to oversimplify. No, it, no, but. no, but I was it was a mixture because I was trying to do I didn't understand how that worked at all. So my brain wasn't like, oh, I should set this stuff. Like it was like, oh, I have a camera. Let me just shoot with this camera. I've only known cameras as auto, like automatic at that moment in my life. So I wasn't familiar with like, my dad has like film cameras that he, he had to like adjust and do stuff. But I, at that moment, you're in my used life, to just like point the thing, hit yeah, the button, just like, and, and it's I know, done. And like, then I, move I on think to the next thing. Like disposable cameras too. So yeah. it was like, I didn't think much of it. And then once I started learning, trying to learn, it felt so foreign to me that I could not get it at all. And it was, and it used to kill me. Like I used to, I used to stress myself so much. I'm like, I don't understand this. And I watched, you know, I learned most of this, a lot of stuff that I learned was through YouTube, you know, through, um, I'll ask other photographers if I ever have a question. So know. quick question, not, mm-hmm. not to interrupt that train no, of thought, sure. but you mentioned YouTube. So you did end up going the YouTube route to learn oh, things. 100%. YouTube was um, massive in this. Massive. And what made you choose YouTube? And again, because how people learn, it's up to their own preference, but I always <laughs> find this interesting. Mm-hmm. What made you use, what made you choose YouTube mm-hmm. versus finding like a famous photographer's book or attending a like because because we do live in a city where there's a lot of ours of attending a seminar mm-hmm. or something like that like what made you go that route instead um the other route never never even crossed my mind like oh, I, wow, I, I never okay. even i never even thought about getting a photo book like i wasn't that far into that like i'm just like oh i want to just shoot and it's like i know i could pick up some stuff on youtube gotcha, and it's okay. like i'm trying to i was at a point when i was trying to take advantage of like the opportunities that i have because i'm like man in this day and age we have access to so much information and i'm just not using that information so it's like learning how to do that um there was a photographer that i came across one time and he had like this book on like on on like his settings and it was it was like this pdf it was, like very big pdf file but i i remember i bought it i had like a ton of stuff i would read stuff when i could too so like i would read a lot of stuff about photography but i just it wasn't until the more I started shooting, the more I would get it. And like concert photography was what really allowed me to grasp kind of like how that worked because I had to move quicker with concert photography. Like once gotcha. I started doing concert photography, I'm like, somebody's coming in here, like I'm learning how to shoot when it's like really dark. So like if there's like a pocket of light on the stage, I might wait for him to get on that pocket of light and then I might have to adjust certain things. So like it forced me to learn how to adjust my settings quickly while I'm shooting. And then from there, I remember like one of the first times that I got home, I was like, oh, I, I understand this like a little bit more now. And it's like, once again, the more you do it, the more you do it, the more you understand it. So, so it's getting those at bats the, the, is another at bats. Yeah, like, yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? Getting oh, those yeah, repetitions 100%. in, it, it getting that training in. I could watch as many videos as I can. As a, but it's like I have to be out there. I have to be out there shooting. Yeah, you can watch videos about working out all day, Bro, but like I'll, until you actually yeah. go to the gym, it's 100%. not gonna ha- you're not gonna have any effect on you. So it's like learning, you know, there, there, and there's so many obstacles that you have to overcome. Just even when you're starting, I'm just like, oh, my gear sucks. Like I have a fucking T3i. There is all these like Sony, all these like Canon camera, all the whatever, and it's like I was obsessed with my gear at one point because I would I would use it as a crutch. Like oh, I'm not doing well because I don't have good gear. You know what I mean? Like you would like. You would make up excuses for yourself and it's all, you know, it's all insecurity. So it's like, oh, I, if I had better gear, I'd be able to get a, you know, a better photo and this and that. So it was like, I had to, I really had to overcome that. Cause that was like a huge, huge obstacle to overcome in the first like year or so, two years. Speaking of gear and, um, God, we've already referenced so many people on the show already. <laughs> um, and I'm going to reference somebody else. Uh, cause Brittany Taylor, 
Brittany, shout out to you, by the way, because you were episode three. And, <laughs> oh, um, wow, and yeah, and and I was, and actually, I forgot to mention this. Um, I will put this in the trailer, though. <laughs> uh, you're episode number 50 for this show, yeah, which is, yeah. which is, ins- yeah, I, awesome. I'm mind blown that <laughs> yeah. I've even done 50 of yeah. these, which is like crazy to me. But, uh, Brittany, Brittany Taylor, um, you've you've been on since episode three, and Brittany was on, and and she made some interesting points because mm-hmm. also being a photographer, similar but not exactly the same, mm-hmm. obviously, just like, like every photographer is yeah, different. Absolutely, but um, you know, she was making some points that I think were really poignant on the idea of like a professional photographer versus an amateur, and her thoughts on that. Um, and I'm paraphrasing, so uh, Brittany, forgive me if I'm not para- para- paraphrasing 100% yeah. correctly. Um, but the idea is that, hey, are you shooting? Are you doing it? Like you're a professional. Like mm-hmm. there, you know. And I and it is interesting, and, and like and I and I agree with her on that. But when you're talking about the gear envy, um, I'll just jump right to. I was having. That, I was gonna say that for later, but I'll jump right <laughs> into it now. What is your thoughts on that? Because like, you know. Um, the episode with Sega Jen. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing this, folks. Yeah, I'm so yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, episode with Sega Jen, shout out to her. Yeah, yeah, uh, we were talking about DJ we'll gear Sega. and like the DJ gear. So it happens, I think, no, like, I think gear envy just happens, like, no matter what you mm-hmm. But what do you think the cause of gear envy was for you um, back then? And do you have a different view on it now? Yeah, yeah, I have a completely different view. Um, <clears throat> at the time, I just think because I didn't know any better, I would just think, you know, you have to have the better gear to get the better shots. You have to have you know, the good lenses to get the better shot, especially if I'm doing, you know, I'm shooting, I'm starting to do concert photography at that time. This was 2018, maybe. And I just remember looking at some photographers who are really incredible. And I'm just like, man, I want to get there. This is and that. So I would always, I would always think that I just needed the better gear and gear does matter. I do think gear does matter. So I don't want to be that person who's just like, gear doesn't matter at all. And this isn't that. I think it does matter to, a, to an extent for sure. Um, but in the beginning, none of that shit matters for the most part for what most of the people are trying to do. And it's like... But also, how do you know the gear is limiting until you've taken your, you your have, current you gear to the limit? Anything. Exactly. That's, that's exactly there's what no it is. Way, there's, there's no way you no can way, know bro. if the gear is good or bad that's, unless you've taken it to its limits and, and I haven't figured done, out, hey, I can't is. go any further. Put it this way. I <clears throat> My gear obsession be, was really intense at one point. I was... So, like, at this time is when I had... I don't know if I already bought my ADD at the time, but I just kept thinking I needed to get a full-frame camera. I need to get a full-frame camera. That was, like, my big thing. And then I remember for months, like, I stopped watching videos on being a better photographer, and I started watching... I got caught up in gear video instead. And then for months, I would be obsessed with gear video. Like, I would wake up, watch gear video, fucking watching it throughout the day. I'm just, like, debating on what to get. Like, I'm already... I'm planning on spending a ton of money that I shouldn't be spending on gear for for something that I'm not even making money in. Right. Because I thought that I needed it, and I'm just, like constantly like watching the you know making lists i'm like doing so much research and then it wasn't until it wasn't until one day that i kind of felt like i was going crazy (laughs) i was like a few days away from like actually purchasing um like a big a big camera like at the time okay and then it wasn't until i had to like reevaluate where i was like whenever i become obsessive with anything it doesn't matter what it is whether it's good or bad what was the camera like why that one you're just like watching was, so many gear videos it was just on so many like... gear videos that i needed a full frame camera i just thought i think oh, pr- okay. probably at the time the camera that was most popular for canon was like 6 6d mark 3 or something like that or mark 4 i think so it was like i just thought i needed a better camera and it was and it wasn't like i said whenever whenever i become really obsessed with something i've gotten lucky that at some point down the line I could like see myself as an outsider. I'm just like, yo, what are you doing? You are upset. Like whether it's good or bad, I'm like, you are obsessed with this thing. You really need to slow it down. And one day I woke up and I went to watch another video and I was like, bro, you got to stop. I was like, and then it was like, literally I had to have a talk with myself. It's like, you're trying to be better. You're trying to get a better camera. You're not even good at what the stuff that you have now. Like you have to focus on the work. You have to focus on being a better photographer before you even remotely start looking into new gear. Cause at this time I already had it. I think at this time I had the ADD, which I've had for like a few months and I just thought I needed a full frame. And then it wasn't, um, and then I just changed everything at that moment. Like the next day I was like, all right, I need to reevaluate everything, what it is that I'm doing with this. So I, I went and I deleted all my gear videos. I stopped, I like unfollow a lot of gear channels I started like putting on my watch later, like uh, stuff about being a better photographer. And I started focusing on just like the art itself instead of focusing on the thing. And that kind of just shifted my whole photography journey, I think. So many questions <laughs> inter- interweave in and out of yeah, 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 one, one um, that comes, that springs to mind. Cause we were talking about gear mm-hmm. and like why you should or shouldn't, you know, upgrade the gear, that, that kind of thing. Um, what do you think sets 
standards when it comes to gear and software. So like, for example, um, like Adobe Lightroom seems to be a pretty standard yeah, software. Absolutely. There's probably other software that yeah, does the same thing, but mm-hmm. Lightroom seems to be the standard. Same with Photoshop. Um, why do you think that happens where it's like this camera is the standard or this software is the standard? Like, what do you think goes into that? Have you, have you like fallen? I want to say fallen victim to it, but like <clears throat> how much stock do you put in that? And has there been times where like something is the standard and you're just like, well, why is this the standard? This shouldn't be like, maybe you found mm-hmm. something that worked better. Yeah. yeah want to yeah. get your thoughts on that. Of course. Um, I don't, I don't care about the standard anymore for the most, you know, I, um, I, it was a standard. I, I could see why certain cameras would be the standard, especially in this day and age with social media, where it's like and software too. Like, I, yeah, I, yeah, I want to get your thoughts on that yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, but like even like with the camera itself, with like with social media, like you know, once there's a photography community created on social media and with YouTube, like that kind of just takes a life within itself. So like once a community starts saying this is like the best one, then everybody starts like aiming, you know, aiming for that. I feel so it's like that 6D Mark IV, whatever it was. I remember that was like the main camera that people would buy. So it's like, oh, all the good photographers have this camera, you know, not knowing I'm brand new. So I'm not knowing that there's like there's photographers with way less way like, you know, lesser gear doing way more. It's just that I'm just focused on the easier thing because that's like the low hanging fruit. I'm not good today, but if I get better gear, I could be at least a little bit better. Like to me, so it's like an easier thing to go to. And then like same thing with Lightroom. I just I'm just going to assume that Photoshop has just been the main editing software for years because they found a way to dominate at some point. And then and um, it must be the best because they're dominating, right? Like there's I like mean, that, that, that mentality like, too. So I think it depends on where you are because right now like there's one that's extremely popular called Capture One. That's like really really popular. It's an editing software for like photos. So it's like it's it's more along the lines of like competing with Lightroom than Photoshop. But it's like that one has gotten really big in the last few years. I've seen a lot of uh, a lot of YouTube photographers that I like admire a lot of their work kind of just like uh, go towards that so it's like it all kind of depends um, where you are but I think for the most part Lightroom is the one that's like the most dominant and it's I think Lightroom is amazing so I don't really have any complaints like I see myself sometimes Capture One renders Fuji files better from my understanding and I shoot mostly my street photography with a Fuji so I, I could see the advantage of that but I don't really care right now to kind of transition into anything else because what I'm doing works perfectly fine you know what I mean can you expound on what when you were like learning like like I guess like the tools of the trade how to use the 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 camera properly learning about different things like um like aperture and settings and things mm-hmm. learning how to edit it, you know make the photo look better in the <clears throat> software because to me it's like you're learning a new language a hundred percent you know what I mean like like you're learning a new language at at that point so how did you how did you approach I guess like adding like these techniques and tools to your tool set, not even from an artistic standpoint, just from a functionality standpoint, but also on top of that, of just like learning the functionalities and things of that nature. Um, how did you think that like, Oh, like maybe you were meeting other photographers and because you were speaking the language more, like you're mm-hmm. in it more, you know what I mean? Yeah, like, of course. like, Hey, you can <clears throat> like learn, like you can learn French and speak, but like when you start like actually talking, it's more fluent. So like, um, so you know, you're learning your techniques, you're learning how to make things happen and you're getting your repetitions, but did also talking about it with other photographers help as well? Yeah, that, that was a big thing. Um, in the beginning, there wasn't that many photographers around. I'm not saying that there wasn't photographers. Gotcha. But there wasn't that many, like when it comes to what I was doing, which was street photography, I didn't really see too many or any at that at that moment doing street photography because it was more, I feel like the photography that I've always seen in Rhode Island is always kind of more like landscape, kind of just like, oh, you know, the state house, the city, the Superman. I mean, I have a shot of like (laughs) like, the the city city, and it looks nice, but like, yeah, it's like that kind of thing. But there's nothing wrong with that. It's just a matter of like, because I'm trying to do something else, I'm getting at that time, if I'm being honest with you, just transparent, I was being inspired by people on Instagram. So there's photographers on Instagram, maybe like two or three. There used to be this one from New York called Ray Lives, I believe is his his Instagram name. And I used to be like a big fault. Like I used to love his work a lot back then. And I used to think how cool that work was. <clears throat> and I wanted to find a way to possibly create something like that. So it was like, so I started a little bit more innocent with just that. And then I started kind of digging more deeper into that, I think. And then I, um, uh, let me see. I'm trying to think. What was I answering? <laughs> Basically, the, by like by talk, like you know, oh, it's one talking. it's one okay, thing, okay. but like yeah, yeah, but yeah, like yeah. by talking to more people, it's like <clears throat> the more you can actually talk to other photographers, other people 100%. doing the thing you're doing, it can yeah, help yeah. strengthen with what you're doing, it helps you learn. Absolutely. So like, just so, like, was there an extent of that happening? Yeah. So like, I when I first started, I reached out to 
a few photographers to see if they could, if I could get some help from them because I didn't know what what I was doing. So like uh, my boy Ernest and and another photographer named Raul from out here. So I was like, I reached out. I was like, oh, you mind if I take you out to to eat? I was like, it's kind of random, but I just I need some help because I have no idea what I'm doing. And Ernest I've known for a while, but Raul I didn't know. I just knew. Um, I just like followed him on Instagram at the time, but and so we, it's just like you appreciate their work. They're like, okay, I appreciate their work. And right. I, need, I, I needed some type of guidance. Ernest has been doing this forever, like, and Raul, I've just been enjoying his work for a long time. So it was nice to get that type of, you know, that type of lecture, that type of help from somebody who's already in that field. And granted, they were doing something completely different from what I was going for, but it didn't matter because to me, it's like you're doing something. You know, you're doing something, and I'm and I and I know that I can learn from you. So it's like, I I, I do think speaking to other photographers was a big help at the time. Now, there is different types of photography out there, right? Like there's mm-hmm. like journalistic style photography. There's the landscapes that you were talking about. There's wedding photographers. Mm-hmm. There are people who specialize in portraits. There's sports photography, which yeah. may fall into that news photography, yeah, yeah, depending, yeah, yeah. On, depending on, it, it, on where it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, there's fashion photography. And then like like you were saying, that there's, there's even street fashion, like the sartorialist mm-hmm. photography. You chose street photography and concert photography because i hate money <laughs> i was gonna say why why those particular two um i think that's just what i was drawn to i think street okay. photog- street photography um when i started getting into it it seemed like the one that <clears throat> that i was more more excited about <clears throat> so it was to me it felt like a no-brainer at the time where it was like i want to tackle something so i want to tackle something because i like it not because it could make me money in that sense mm-hmm. and um same thing with concerts i've been like i said earlier me and i've been going to concerts forever so i was i always thought that I could do well if I like put my mind into that, like shooting concerts. So it took a long time. Like there was a few times, like I always remember whenever I would go to concerts, I would always get like one or two decent shots, like with my phone. And I'll post that on my personal page because I always felt like I had a decent eye. And I would get some comments. I would get some compliments on it. And then like I would get excited at the time. I just would never be able to kind of just say, hey, I'm going to try this photography thing now because it seemed like too permanent. So it was like, oh, let me just throw something out there, see if people like it or not. So but it's uh to me those are the two ones that I like that I kind of care for the most. Right now I'm doing more portraits too, but it's like street portraits, so that's kind of still mixed in with like street photography. Where I'm like asking strangers for portraits, so that's like a big thing for me. But I'm liking that I'm learning, I'm enjoying more portraits like that than like actual like let's do a portrait shoot. Depending, you know what I mean? No, it makes sense, but it le- it leads to perfectly to a question I have because mm-hmm. you know with the different styles of photography, um. It's interesting. It's interesting that photography is both like this artistic medium, mm-hmm. right? But then it's also a form of documenting what's going on. Yeah. And it can actually be a tool in, you know, kind of putting out the truth or like a tool to like to like, you know, to fight against oppression and things like that <coughs> by sure. documenting things that's of going course. on. Like there's a power there. Um what are your thoughts on photography as a tool and as more of just like a function, like a utility versus artistic expression? And, you know, and I think the lines get blurred sometimes, especially nowadays, uh, especially now. <clears throat> but where do you, where do you think hmm. that differentiation lies? I mean, it's, it's hard because like I said, nowadays I feel it's hard to tell the difference, especially a lot of times it's like your intention, I'm assuming. So it's like what I'm in, you know, what my intention is with this photo, with that photo, I think. So it's, um, it's hard to, I, th- I think all of it is necessary. So I think we need that person who's just doing it to just grab, just to make money. I think that person as an artist, I think, you know, I, I think all of those people are needed. And luckily in today's day and age, I don't feel like you have to stay on one side of that um, personally, because I think that there's things that I do that it's just like, oh, this is my, might make more sense financially. But like my art is always going to be like, you know. I'm still always going to hold that close to the chest on that end. So it's like, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think there's room for it for, I think there's room for both nowadays. If that makes sense. It does. And I, and I want to circle back to that because yeah, there's yeah. that, you know, more businessy questions are going to be sprinkled throughout. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but there's one that's going to be pertinent for that. Uh, but I do want to talk more about, you know, okay. So you chose your, style of photography and like, Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot concerts and mm-hmm. I want to shoot street style photography. That's my jam. Great. There are other street style photographers mm-hmm. and other concert photographers, right? <clears throat> Go to any concert. Mm-hmm. There's like more than one, usually oh, yeah, more than one sure. person doing the thought. Yeah, yeah, sure. What do you think mm-hmm. develops a photographer's style? What do you think 
developed your personal style. So like, you know, what, what goes into a, a photographer's style? Because it's from the outside perspective, you'd be like, well, you're just, you know, you're pointing a camera and you're yeah, shooting. Like, how yeah, is that? Yeah, yeah. What, what's, what stylistic choices are actually going in there? And mm-hmm. what do you think, what do you think makes you stand out as a photographer versus other street style and concert photographers? Um, I think it depends. I think some of my style, some people know, know it to be a little bit grittier. Like some of my street work, like maybe some of my black and white, that was like what I was getting a lot more known for at one point. So it's like, I think I use a lot of harsh shadows. I use, you know, I find ways to kind of play with the light a little bit better than other people might. Um, and, you know, the way the way that I feel that I got to these things is, is just trying. Like, uh, if I'm being honest with you, I always tell people when you're starting, just work as much as you can and imitate whoever you want to imitate. Like, because you're going to find your style in the process of, like, you know, trying out other people's style because you don't know what you're doing. Like, look at Tarantino when we spoke about Tarantino earlier. Right. I mean anything you could possibly think of a Western, a Japanese film, anything that he's just going to find a way to mold it. He, he got like, he's a like bunch I, I, I want to make that thing I saw, but I'm going to do it in and like my weird, my weird filter. But you have to get to the, you know, it's hard to get to that point artistically, but the only way to get to that point is continuing to, to, to try and fail and try and fail. Cause like my style, I used to think that I could never find a style. And I used to be obsessive over like, man, my, my photography page doesn't really have like, it's not cohesive. That was like the main thing that I, that I used to feel for a very long time until I got to a point where I stopped caring so much whether it's cohesive or not. And I just started focusing on the work and I would just post to post to just show people that I'm working. And eventually that molded into something else, which I think I always remember one of my friends um, when he hit me, he was like, wow, your page is really cohesive. This was like eight months after like I started not thinking about it. And I remember just looking at that kind of, I was like, damn, that's wild. I was like, that was something that I wanted so bad early. And, and all it took is just to me to focus on the work to kind of get to that point, I think. So that brings up something else as far as, um, you know, choosing a style and stylistically uh, can it's weird because even from a non photographer, non artistic perspective, Mm -hmm. it's one of those things where like if a shot is bad quote mm-hmm. like quote unquote i'm putting this i put this in air quotes people yeah, yeah, quote unquote, yeah, yeah. i don't go on camera that's that's <laughs> the guest job <laughs> yeah yeah i'll do it for him <laughs> but like you kind of know but you don't like you, you would probably know better than others obviously that's how why, hence why i want to ask the question but it's like i know why this shot is bad but i can't explain it so it's like can you really critique photography or you're critiquing certain aspects of photography it, it just like you can kind of tell when a shot is bad but like it's i don't know it's one of those weird things like I know there's something off, but I don't know why it's off. Yeah, because like, it's not. So can just, photography not, really be critiqued in that yeah, sense? Because it's not just black and white, where it's like either this is this color. If it's not that color, it's wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like I think it can. I think I think it all just depends on who's critiquing it, and I just gotcha, think it depends okay. on like where your state of mind is. Because it's like if somebody who has, if somebody who has like who's more familiar with this work, like let's say they've been do, they've been a fan for a while, maybe they study or something, they might see it from a different perspective than me. And it's like, and that's not to say that their opinion is right. You know what I'm saying? It's just a matter of, you could take it a little bit differently because this person knows a little bit more than somebody else who doesn't know anything. But so it all depends kind of where you're seeing it. Cause it's, I think at the end of the day, I've gotten to a point where I'm confident in, I'm confident hearing somebody critique my work because it's only going to do two things for me. It's either going to, is that going to make me feel stronger? Like, if I think they're wrong, it'll just make me feel stronger about stronger about how I felt about the image. Or they might just show me something that I didn't see. And they might bring something to light that I'm like, oh, shit, I didn't even notice that. Yeah, that, that does. Now I can't unsee that, basically. Yeah, like, you're like oh, crap. Yeah, like, yeah, so it's like, like, and, oh, that, no. and that's good, too. So it's like, you know, I'm very, if I'm being honest with you, I am extremely critical. I am very, I'm very critical of my, I'm more critical of my work than I think anybody could be of my work. But I'm critical of everybody because it's just the way that I is the way that I see the art. You know, there's cer- there's certain things that I appreciate from people, like I appreciate different things from from different artists. Like I don't just think, oh, they just do photography. All of their work inspires me. Maybe your drive inspires me. Maybe your work inspires me. Maybe this color, is, you know, there's like different uh, there's like different elements to it. I think so. It's um, there's just so many to choose from. I think. So with that being said, I'm curious. Can you walk through? Even if it's not like something that's being sold ultimately, which and we're gonna get into that those yeah, parts yeah. too. Can you walk through? Cause I I don't think people really are uh, at least in my humble opinion. I don't think the general public is aware of like how much goes into that 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 shot that they saw or purchased. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's obviously different depending on the type of oh, photography of you're course, doing. Definitely, for sure. Can you walk through just from beginning to end, like, oh. Like, this is the camera I pack. This is the lens I pack. This is why I pack this camera. This is why I pack this lens. This is how I approach shots on the street. This is how 
this is what goes into my decision taking that shot mm-hmm. because like if you're out in the street like there's other things you can't it's not like a studio where you can control lighting and all these yeah, things you have no control like you have no control so like you're, that, you're that observing. that's that's got to be like a whole other just like other problems that like <clears throat> other types of photographers don't have yeah. to you know deal with basically of course so can you just walk through like all that stuff like do you plan on going out for a day do you are there times where you have your phone and you don't have the camera can you just like walk through the entire process beginning to end of like chose camera chose lens mm-hmm. this is why going out okay i saw these things i documented these things i took these pictures mm-hmm. and then you can, and even walk through the post processing until you get the finished product can you just walk through all of that so like i don't so i try not to overthink it so like for example if i'm gonna go out shooting the majority of the time that i'm shooting is with my fuji with my x100v it's like a 35 millimeter lens so like that's like my favorite camera i've owned and i've that's kind of turned into like just my everyday camera ever since i bought it back in 2020 so it's like the majority of the time i'm shooting with that because i love that focal length it's good enough for if i want to do portraits or if i want to shoot get something from afar brief you know. side question before we go into this process thing because mm-hmm. it's i think it's it was a question I had later, but it's too good not to yeah, ask yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. So you mentioned, because we were talking about gear envy and things, you mentioned that Fujifilm. And I noticed on your website, you were saying how you were feeling uninspired with the previous camera. And then you're like, oh, I picked this camera because it's like, so I'm like, I feel creative and inspired again. Yep. Yeah. But it's very weird that like, oh, a piece of gear brought inspiration. Of like, course. you know, especially from an out, like from an outside perspective. Mm-hmm. And also because we just talked about you shouldn't have gear yeah, envy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why did that new piece of gear make like why the switch to that one to make you and why did it make you feel inspired again? So I think it depends. So like for example, like put it this way, the Fuji I've been using it since 2020, like almost religiously at this moment. And then at some point last year, um, around like September or like August, I was getting tired of the focal length. I'm like, man, I've been walking Providence for so long with the same focal length. So it's just like in my mind, it's just like I kind of just feel like I need a switch of something. At this moment, since I bought the camera, I damn near have not stopped using it every week, basically. And then I was like, I need to put this camera aside just a little bit because I feel that I'm already just tired of this focal length. So like at that moment, back in September of last year, I started can using... You, can you explain what focal length is just for the people who don't know? Yeah, or just like for how like how wide like you could see from the camera, basically. 35 is usually, I think it's pretty close to where your eyes can see. So okay. like from how wide it is. Okay. So it was like, I think I was just tired of seeing my scenery with that same focal length because it wasn't a camera that I could zoom in and out of. So, ah, so okay. it's just like, it's a, it's a prime lens. That camera, you can't remove the lens. So it's just like, it's a 35 for life, 35 millimeter lens for life. So it's like, and then like at that moment, I started I started using my Canon, which is a, is a little bit bigger. It's not like smaller for street photography, but I just needed the, the different focal length because I needed like a change of pace. And then I used that camera from like October until March, maybe, or April. And then, and then when I picked up my Fuji again, I was like, oh, refreshing. Like, now it just feels like, you know what I mean? Like, I needed that break from it because I was way too tired of doing the same thing. To pull it back to the previous question, so mm-hmm. pick your camera. So, yeah, like, what go, so, like, besides picking the camera, like, what goes into what lens you pick? Is there a go-to lens for your street? Is there, like, once you pick it? Again, walk through just the whole yeah, yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah. Like, well, be, well, because it, determining because, how you, like, with the location, yeah, whatever, yeah. everything. So, I don't, so, like, because of, like, the Fuji itself, because you can't remove the lens, it's always going to be a 35 millimeter. Oh, so, okay. if I take the Fuji, I'm shooting with that. Yeah, you're like, like, okay, we're, we're rocking just, with that's this. Just, that's just what it is. So, All it's right. like, I've learned this better. I like limiting myself. When I used to walk around early in my earlier days with a bunch of different lenses, I would overthink things and be like, oh, if I had my 85 millimeter, I could get this shot closer. And, like, I'm switching stuff. And it's like, this is taken away from, like, the time that I could be focusing on the work, basically. So, it's like, so, like, usually, if, like, let's say if it's, like, a regular day in Providence, I would literally just get the camera, go to Providence. I, I always get, like, this pit of, this, like, kind of, like, nervousness in my stomach before I go out. Like, I feel like it's, it almost never goes away even to this day. But sometimes I, like, park and just kind of wait it out a little bit. But then once I'm out there, I'm just, I don't typically have a, a certain destination unless I'm looking for something in particular. But I think with street photography, you have no idea what's, what's to come. Like, some of the best photos came from days that I didn't want to shoot, but I just told myself I have to shoot because I have to get in these reps. Because I have to see it that way, like an exercise, too. Like, I have to see it as, like, I don't want to shoot today, but I told myself I would shoot. And I have to get better at this, so I have to kind of go out there and shoot. And then, you know, well, there are a couple of, there's a couple of questions here in this in this larger process question. Mm-hmm. Do you, re- like, what goes into, like, your decision, this is, this is, this is when I'm going to actually hit the button to take the image? Like what? What goes into that? Like what? What is your mind going through? Because there is things like composition, rule mm-hmm. of thirds, and all that. Like what? What is your? I guess like the computer's got to process before it put, yeah, gives yeah. you the output. So like, what is your? What is your your There's, your photography yeah, brain yeah, yeah. computing yeah. as you're making that decision? I think it. I think 
because of street photography, it varies. Like the beauty, the beauty behind street photography is that it's like, it's landscape is, you know, portraits. It's like, you know, documentation. Like it is like a mixture of everything. And that's why I find it like so beautiful. Like that, you know, that whole process. So it's a lot of times it all depends what I'm looking for. If I'm out there and I see something, let's say I see the light that I really like, I might like just follow that light a little bit more. If I see a color that I like, I might just think, oh, this just looks, this complements this color well, this scenery, you know? So it's like, I feel like it all, I have to go out there with an open state of mind for the most part to just know that anything kind of could can come my way for the majority of the times. There's certain times that you do limit yourself, which I think is good too to go out there and be like, I'm just going to focus on getting like a harsh shadow shot. And I could at least just like focus on this one thing. So it kind of, I could come back with like that image that I'm hoping to get. But usually it's like, I don't know what I'm going to go out there and get. So I just go out there and just like kind of just be a little bit more spontaneous with it. Having limits. Do you think that helps with the creativity sometimes to like, to like, I guess give an analogy <clears throat> I personally feel like just from my time working, you know, in music production and things like that, that their gear, everything happens. But then people are like, oh, I need this compressor on the track, blah, blah, blah. But like somebody who's experienced would be like, they know how a compressor works so mm -hmm. they can get, they can, they can make, you know, a good song great, mm -hmm. even with maybe not the best piece of gear in the world because they know inside and out how to use that tool. And they know, they know like, why they're doing what they're doing mm -hmm. versus someone who bought the most expensive thing, but they don't know why that thing why? is the most of expensive course. thing or why it's, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's so do you, do you think that that, that having like less choice and just kind of really knowing your stuff and knowing in the, the, the thing you're using inside and out, do you think that actually gives you better quality and, and more freedom? Not mm. necessarily less. I think it's a huge advantage personally um it whether you, it's, a, it's, it's up to you whether you could recognize it or not because like if you're just constantly complaining about i don't have the gear then you're gonna miss out on the on like the lesson that you could have learned if you actually focus on with the gear that you do yeah, have. It's, it's like why not just like <coughs> learn why way. the thing is the way mm -hmm. it is of course. and then when you get that gear then you're gonna really like mm -hmm. of go course. off i also don't think most people a lot of people that start doing certain things aren't in it for the long haul so like some people just see like oh wow that's cool you're getting a lot of love for photography well, i want to do that you know so it's just like gotcha. they don't really care like I, I remember um one kid one time hit me up about something about wanting to shoot concerts and then he was like how could you how could i get into strain and i was just like well it doesn't i was like it doesn't really work that way and i was like have you shot anything He's like no i haven't shot any concerts and i was like well you have to you got to build up that portfolio a little bit you know a little bit more before anybody would want to give you an opportunity you know so it's like um so it's like tough because i don't think everybody's in it for the same reason so it's <clears throat> so i think it just kind of depends on where your state of mind is at that moment you know does that make sense makes perfect yeah. sense and actually Leads to my question of, you know, we're still on this like kind of like how how the process works. Mm -hmm. So you you're making it, you know, you've all the decision making in your brain. You're now hitting, you know, you're now hitting that button that's going to take that image. Mm -hmm. Do you realize in the moment, and and again, this may be a self critiquing thing too, mm -hmm. but do you do you ever realize in the moment like, yeah, this is a good, this is going to be a good shot, or? have you realized it after the fact, like once you have the shot and you're like, upload and you're like, and, and you upload it mm -hmm. or do you realize it after the, and I want to talk about this too. Or do you, or is it like after all the post processing is done mm -hmm. or does it vary? <laughs> I think it varies. Um, it's rare for me to see a shot and I'm just like, this is like, fucking, this is the one fucking amazing. Like it is rare. So when it happens, because I don't allow myself to just be like, Oh, I, I fucking killed it today. I just know I got great work. Like I'm not like that because realistically that's not the way things are. Even if I feel like it, I have to kind of look through it. Well also but before it, digital photography, you kind of didn't know, I guess, yeah, because film, you had to wait like, till the things got film? developed. Yeah, 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 with film, absolutely. So it's like, it's a, it's a different thing. It's funny. The first time I ever noticed that the first time I ever got a shot that I thought was an excellent shot, it was like, I might've been two years into this. And it's one of the most, one of like my most successful shots that I've had in the sense of like selling that image. But it's like when I saw the shot, I remember I, it was somewhere in, um, it was in downtown. It was like really foggy night and I just got home and I was like, man, it's such a nice foggy night. I should go out. And at this time, this was back in 2018, I think. Um, I was just trying to get, uh, I was just trying to get better at it. And um, I just remember I went out, this was 2019 actually. And then I remember I, I went out and within like a few minutes into the shot, into, into shooting, I'm like near the P pack, um, and I saw some guy that was like trying to go into the subway that used to be there, and for some reason, like with the lens that I had, I just luckily had the proper lens on me to like make this this thing work, and then I just remember I saw it, I was like, oh man, that's a nice shot, and then I remember I was like, he's going into subway, but they're closed, so he's gonna come back out. So I was like, let me see if I could just wait for this person, and I just posted there, and literally within three seconds, he just came right back out. I took two photos. I remember looking at the photo. That was the first time ever that I was just like, oh, this is really good. And then it's, and it's funny because 
I got home, I edited it, and I'm still excited about it. I don't always get excited to that degree, especially at that time. And, like, I posted it. And then at the time, there was, like, one of those, like, local, you know, photography pages posted it, which they never do. Like, for a few years, like, I never used to get any love from, like, those pages, like, except for PVD Street. Um, but there was, like, this other, this other page that posted it. And then I was like, oh, shit, literally within, like, three minutes of me posting, I was like, oh, cool. So it's cool that I felt so good about this shot. This shot got a lot of love. And then, like, I've sold that shot multiple times. Somebody bought that shot in, at the time, it was, like, the biggest piece I've ever done, which was, like, 40-something by 50-something inches. They wanted it to cover, like, their entire house. So it was, like, I mean, their entire, entire house. Their entire that'd war. Be, yeah, that'd yeah, be fun. I would love to thing. see that, actually. But it, they wanted it to cover the entire wall. What is your house? Downtown yeah, Providence know, landscape. You just, you just see it right there. But it was cool to be able to get that. And it was cool that I, at least I thought it was a good shot at the moment. And it's kind of, like, you know last of the test of time in my perspective at least but i think the majority of the times you kind of i kind of just wait i might think it's a good shot but i'm like i won't know until i get home like that's the way that i've noticed because sometimes i think it's a good shot and i get home i'm like fuck it's blurry i didn't even know it was like super uh, i was blurry. gonna be i was gonna say has the has the opposite ever happened where you thought you had the good shot and yeah, you get home, oh, you're yeah, like oh crap sure. oh yeah yeah okay yeah and it's like it's you know one of the beauties of this thing because we're all you know as a street photographer i'm just like observing and like in a different level i think but it's like it's learning that the shots will come to you eventually. Like I used to go out there with intentions like, I want to get a shot like this. I want to get a shot like this. And then I would always fail. And I realized that like, it's, it's not up to me. It's like, it comes to me whenever it comes. And if I'm just like constantly like aware, if you get into a flow state, eventually yeah, like, the output's going to come. Like, and the beauty behind stuff like that, like the beauty behind street photography is that I think it's more of a mentality than like a thing, like in a sense of like having a street photographer's mentality where I could take like a street photo style photo anywhere I'm at. And it's like, you know, one of my favorite photos that I've taken within the last few years was like from my phone it was like an i think i had an iphone 11 at the time and it's like i've always used to always want this photo it was like kind of like those some like those like generic photos of somebody like on a bus and it's like i always wanted like my own version of like somebody like isolated on the bus or something like that and then one time i remember i was we were on our way to massachusetts and i was like on the passenger side and i looked to my right and i just like see this guy on the bus by himself and i was like wow that looks beautiful and i just like took up my phone took a photo of it and i was like Wow, that's a great, like, I thought in my head, I was like, wow, what a great shot. I thought maybe people would enjoy it. I never, I never take a photo and post it, at, like, instantly, like, never. I think it's happened, like, two, three times. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm not driving, so I'll just edit it real quick. I posted it, and, like, I was so caught off guard by the love that I got at the time. And then, like, I remember I did a gallery, like, a year later, and the first photo that sold was that photo. It was, like, the only photo that I had of an iPhone, and that was, like, the first photo that, fold, that, that sold that whole night. So it's, like, if you let them come to you, like, eventually, you know, if you're observing properly, I think... So you have you have you have the shot. It doesn't didn't come out blurry when you uploaded yeah, it. Yeah. Um, what goes into post processing? Mm -hmm. What do you use? What do you actually do? Mm -hmm. um, what are your decisions in that? Because I think that's another thing that people don't realize. Like, oh, that amazing shot was just taken. It's like, no, they they probably did some like work. Oh yeah, yeah on it sure. after the fact. Yeah. And it all depends too. Um, and yeah, and it's so, like, what yeah, is yeah, your what yeah, is yeah, your what depends. is your personal process for post processing? I Meaning, you have the shot. Um, it's not blurry. Like you can tell yeah, what's yeah, in there. Unless yeah, it was yeah. intentionally like, supposed to be, be blurry. Yeah, I was gonna say that too. But um, but like it, w the intention is correct. Mm -hmm. You've noticed yeah, that. Yeah. So now it's okay. What do you do post processing wise? What goes into your decision making there? What tools do you use, etc.? Mm -hmm. Um, I always I always feel like my my process is pretty simple in the sense of I typically just upload it to my Lightroom. I have an external hard drive where all my work goes into it, so it's not like saved on, onto my actual computer. And can you just break down what like again? I'm oh, yeah, assuming yeah, that I'm, nobody I'm, knows anything. Yeah, I apologize. What so is Lightroom? Lightroom is Why a, do you I'm use sorry, it? We spoke about it. Yeah, Lightroom is just an editing software. So it's like where I, you know, I just upload all my images to Lightroom, and that's where I edit the images. You know, I could change the colors, the cropping, anything that I want to at that moment. So that's like the main the main tool that I use for for editing. Like I have it on my phone, I have it on my computer, and I have it on my iPad, and I could literally work from all of them together, which is like pretty cool, I think. So it's like I could start editing on my Mac and finish it on my phone, or finish it on my iPad, or something like that. So it's like, and then when it comes to that, it's literally just, it all depends what I'm aiming for. You know, I edit, I, I don't feel like I, I overly edit my images. Like I like natural colors for the most part. I do like the colors to pop a little bit more. So in the last year I've worked a little bit more with colors. So I'm trying to kind of get that a little bit um, better. So, you know, and once, if I'm being honest with you, as simple as it sounds, once I, once I finish editing my stuff, it's literally just uploading it back into, like, um, the final product onto the external hard drive, and I just do what I want with it at that moment. Like, whether if I want it for Instagram, whether I wanted to print it, you know, because there's, like, so many ways you could go about it. And there's different dimensions for different things. Oh, completely like you said, somebody stuff. wanted it to cover, like, a wall versus, like, I want to, like, just... Have like, it in my bathroom. Have it in my... Yeah, yeah or, like, yeah, hang yeah. it up in a frame. Yeah, yeah. So it's, like, it's learning... 
you know, it's just kind of, I feel like learning all that as you go, the more you do it, the more you learn. Cause it's people buying your work is very like intimidating. Like, I feel like people looking at your work to like buy is like feels very intimidating. Like the first few times that you're there. Um, I have some questions about that in a, yeah. in, in a bit. <laughs> um, you know, since we're on the subject of post-processing, I think it's interesting. Um, and I want your thoughts on, on the following. At what point in your opinion mm -hmm. is the post-processing, not too much from a stylistic because it's like, hey, whatever, you know, you mm -hmm. took the image, it's, you know, do what, do what you want. But like from a, I guess like a, almost like lying standpoint. And what I mean, and so just to give that some context, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the idea of like unrealistic beauty standards mm -hmm. in, you know, fashion or in modeling, things like that. And... I understand on the one side that that can be kind of subjective because it's like, okay, well, then what is your definition of beauty, though? Like, mm -hmm. who, like whose definition are we using? Things like that. But I do agree from a purely uh, func uh, functional standpoint when a photographer can go in and just start, sh like, literally, l I mean, quite literally shaving pounds, like, oh, shave yeah, like yeah, shaving yeah, yeah, yeah. skin off yeah, of somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh, of course. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Where like where we have tools where you can like take somebody's head and blend into somebody else's body and it's like yeah. seamless now and it's and you can do it very quickly. Mm -hmm. At what point is the post processing a lie? Like at what point it's like that, hey like like where's the cutoff? I guess and like what is your thoughts on that? Because you know I can agree that yeah when you're like that li that literally is an unrealistic beauty standard because that thing doesn't exist. Yeah, like yeah, you you sure. literally did so much post that processing exist. that yeah, you yeah. created something that literally cannot exist mm -hmm. in nature. Like it yeah. cannot exist in real life, mm -hmm. which is fine if you're shooting a movie and everything, mm -hmm. but like if you're putting that on, I, I get this side of that, that if you're putting that on the cover of a magazine and you're presenting that as, oh, hey, it's real, we just touched it up. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you, you created something that literally did not exist in that photo yeah, shoot. Like, you sure. know what I mean? So like, do you think there's a line and do you think like what, like is there like a crossing of the line? Do you think people don't care? Like, and where is that line? Where should it be? Because I think it's an interesting Spe specifically in post processing, yeah, like yeah. there's like it's like this weird thing that happens, and I'm and I I can't even fully wrap my head around it. Hence why I bought up the unrealistic beauty standards because I think I think that's yeah, like yeah. I think that's the example that most people so can un yeah, can yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah, of course. Of um, course. but just what are your thoughts on that? Um, I do think there's a line at least for me, but I just don't think society gives a fuck about my line. You know, so it's like it depends on <clears throat> when it comes to like that fashion stuff. Anytime I see anything, I just assume for the most part. But I have a different perspective. But you're, you've, but you've I also do it, and you're behind the Correct. scenes. Yeah, yeah. So it's like I have a different perspective. Um, with me, there's a line in the sense of like I don't like, I don't like overly photoshopping my images. Like there's certain street photographers that might overly photoshop images, and there's like well, they'll, they'll, they'll like take a building and they'll like multiply it and make it seem like that they're in like a cityscape, and the cityscape doesn't even exist. Yeah. And you're like so, that so, thing doesn't so, actually exist. Jesus. So, so, so it depends in the sense of like if I think that it's actually like it's apparent that it isn't real. But it's a president isn't real, so you're just aiming for this style, whatever. Cool, that's like more power to you. There's a lot of people that overly like, you know, now nowadays you could fucking Photoshop a sky instantly into whatever you want. And it's like, who am I to say no? Because I think all this stuff is, is inevitable because once once again, like the whole thing we spoke about earlier, that once Pandora's box is open, like that's it. Like so the idea that we could even edit images instantly, somebody's gonna be like, Oh, then I'm just gonna I'm gonna take it to this extent. So it's like And image editing back in the days pre computer was like, you know, they did touch ups, but it's not like what you can do now. So it's funny, so they did they did more touch ups than I understood. So I'll, I'll, I'll do, like in a sense of like because like once I started like looking into like I'm obs I, like I'm obsessed with photo books. So like once I started like getting more into photo books and do and looking at all these like older legendary photographers, I was like, oh wow, they photoshopped back then way more than I expected. And like there's certain really big name photographers that I've seen Photoshop such a massive piece, like such a such a big piece out of this image that it did make me see it differently when I when I saw that it was photoshopped this way. But at the end of the day, for them, how they're putting it out there, it really doesn't matter to them. Because you know it's I mean? also their artistic expression. It, but it's, their artistic it, but it, it's just a weird thing. So, a, yeah, so yeah. do you think it's more about how it's being presented then? Because well, going, back, like, going back to that previous example of the unre like putting out an unrealistic thing, like again, I guess then it, that goes into an even broader question. When does it become... It's too much. Like when does the artistic expression stop in the line and like oh, the, yeah, the yeah. lying begin? I guess yeah, like you like you don't want to you don't want to crap on anybody's artistic expression, but at, at the same time, it's like that wasn't yeah. real. Like you and know, it's, and it's tough because, like I said, I think it's all different perspective, and it's some people might find some people if they might be fine with them being superly photoshopped. 
I'm not a big fan of that personally. I also don't do that type of photography all the time. But when I do, like if I do, like let's say I'm shooting a wedding or I'm doing portraits, like there's certain things that I remove from the person's face. Like if it's like a pimple or something that's just like temporary on their face. Yeah, because like I get like you know I get I mean? fixing blemishes and Stuff things like that, that but, like, to when make it comes the to, photo like, like I've work. Seen, I've seen people just the whole face, the body. I think that's it's like a completely so, different person. I think that's wild personally. Once again, though, more power to them if they think that's thing. I don't think it's good for like society as a whole. Like, realistically, because you set these, like, unrealistic standards, especially when it comes, you know, when it comes to women, like, they set these unrealistic standards that they can, they can't possibly live like, up to. Like, no, like, like, and, like and, they, and they do with guys, too. Like, there's, like, you know, like, think of any men's health magazine yeah, where course. it's like, yeah, that guy is ripped, but, like, they're literally adding yeah. in muscle definition that's not there. And I'm of like, course, that's, that's so it's the like, literal... Yeah. That's the literal definition of unrealistic yeah, yeah, standard because you, you injected something that's yeah. not real. You can't get there. So it's and, it, and it's all, you know, that's, that all comes down to, like, my perspective on things. Like, I could, at one point in time, things like that would drive me crazy because it was something that I thought, oh, this is unfair, blah, 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 blah. But I don't have control over any of that. So it's like, if it sucks, I just know that if I don't want it, if I don't like it, I'm just not going to do it myself. I can't control how other people do it. I, I do think, like I said, I do think it's too much a lot of times. I don't like things being overly processed. I don't. You know, I think some photographers just do it too much, but that's just my personal taste. Um, but more power to them because I'm not, at this very moment, that's not kind of like where I am, I am artistically, at least. Do you have any photos that you really love versus photos that sold really well versus photos that maybe they sold well, but you personally just don't like them anymore? Um, it's not that I don't like them anymore. Sometimes you just get tired of like the like okay. he's almost like fucking um Nirvana with how he got tired of smells like Teen Spirit. Like he just heard like, 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 oh, I'm, I'm I mean, sick of it now. I'm sure he did not know that song was gonna be so massive. <laughs> so it's like I'm sure and then every time they see him like, oh dude, you know, do smells like Teen Spirit, that has to be exhausting. Like, oh, especially if you're trying to be like an actual artist out here. So it's like, you know, I think about that. I had one image the for one of the first times I did a market, um, I sold an image of of a sunflower with like the Superman in the back. I was not exp- that was like my billboard single for me, like from my perspective, like I felt like once like I started selling that, I remember that, I was, that was like, the calling card, bro. Like people just loved it. Like I remember it was, it might've been like my, I don't know, second or third Providence fleet that I did at the time. And I just remember I was like, Oh cool. This, this, we sold a lot of this. Like I sold a lot of this photo today. And then, and then I started getting people asking, Oh, can I get this photo bigger? Can I get it in a canvas? Can I get a thing? And then I feel like by the end of the year, by the end, within like a year and a half, like there's no image that I sold more than that at all. Like it was, and it was like, I remember when I used to do the sunflowers in downtown, Mm-hmm. So it was like a photo that's like kind of showing the sunflower, and you see the Superman building in the back. Yep. At the time, I didn't. Once again, I didn't know how much people love sunflowers. I actually know the image you're talking about. Like yeah, at least they, like the first one. So like I had. So like it's funny. So I had two. So like after, let's say like two years after that image, I felt like I've gotten a lot better as a photographer, and I was like, you know what? This this is. I would like to give myself a challenge and see if I could recreate this image in a different way with my new with my new knowledge. And I went out there, and to me, I did. I felt like I did an image that was way better. Like way better and it was like to the point where i knew i was like i'm not ever cocky about these things but i know that when i post this this is gonna get an astronomical amount of love like it ended up being my most like photo that year by far the thing that i sold the most the image that i sold the most last year because it was like instead of just like one it was instead of superman building it was like the whole city behind it so it just looks kind of like a layer of like some flowers and thing and then people would be like oh is this photoshop like how can you get these sunflowers because a lot of people weren't familiar with like that section downtown right so it was like you know, and I got tired of it in a sense of like, I just used to see it all the time, but I'm never, I never like hated in a sense because I'm happy that I was even able to get something like that. And I knew, you know, and I went out and tried too. when you go out and try to succeed, it kind of feels, it feels good too. So I noticed on your LinkedIn that it says oh, wow. you're a freelance photographer, October, 2017 to now. Is there is there anything significant about yeah, October 2017, or is that just like, yeah, I'll put that sounds like a good date? Like, yo, I, mean, I didn't know if there's like a special yo, moment. Like, so I just really wanted to get into that. I haven't that. looked at my LinkedIn in so long, but yeah, it's been such a long time. Um, only reason I say that is because that's when I created my my photography page. So to me, the moment that I created my photography page was the moment that I felt that I was like, okay, I'm going to fully do this in some shape or form because it felt more permanent for me in my head. Okay. So, so it was like I just had my personal page, and it was like. I was like, I want to do this, but I want to do something that's just like makes a statement. It's like, guys, this is what I'm going to try. And I never, at that moment in my life, I never really went out, out of my way to tell anybody, hey, I'm going to try this. So if I fail, you guys will see me fail, you know? So it was like. So it was being vulnerable too. Like, extremely, like, uh, bro. You're, you're, you're it was like, extremely okay, you're, vulnerable. You're, 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 you're passing that threshold yeah, now. Yeah, man. It was so, I mean, I felt, I remember the feeling of it. I remember on, I remember 
at that at those early stages, you always feel like every decision you make is a massive decision. Like you feel like, oh, whatever Instagram page I have now, I have to keep it. Like whatever name I have, this or whatever, is gonna determine the rest this of my is life. This gonna determine the yeah. You feel that way. So like, I'm. It took me hours to even like hit that create button to hit that post. But like, it was like I remember being a, being in my apartment just pacing back and forth, and then um, you know. But then once, so like that's how I feel. That that particular time was like that's when I really started this whole journey because I was just making it public for myself and like just for others to know. And it took, a, you know, it took, a, it took a while to, I got a lot of love, but it took a while for like to get it to a, in a much better place. Like my goal for a while used to be like, I want more followers in my personal page. And that shit used to feel impossible for years. I was like, man, this shit's never going to happen. So, but it was like kind of just like a small goal for me to just like, kind of just like try to achieve something on my own. You know what I mean? Well, speaking of that, speaking of your website, you have your portfolio up there. Mm -hmm. Can you briefly explain just for the, the, the uninitiated, the uninitiated. Wow. I almost <laughs> didn't get that one. Correct. The uninitiated. There we go. Uh, what a portfolio is. Cause it's almost kind of like, to me, it's like a resume for creatives. If you really think that's about how, it, that's how I feel about um, it what now when it comes to a regular person, it's like, you know, or not regular, I should say a non-creative person's resume. It's mm -hmm. like, all right, here's my work history. Let me make it sound most yeah, likely yeah, better yeah. than it was and dates and times mm -hmm. and like where it was and what I did. It's pretty straightforward. Of course, of course. However, the resume in the creative sense, aka the portfolio, you are intentionally choosing and directly choosing mm -hmm. what goes in there. And I'm, mm -hmm. and like, you know, it is, it is your work too, kind of in a sense of like, this is the work that I've yeah. done and stuff like that. Same concept in a, in a sense of a resume. But also cause like you can have mo like, you can maybe have different portfolios for different types of jobs, different types of purposes. So what made, like what made you pick photos that went into your portfolios were the ones that, that you, that you felt strongly about? Was it ones that, you know, could get you work? Like Got what it. went into that decision? Like, cause then it's like, here's my resume. Mm -hmm. But unlike other people, it's not like, I'm just going to pick random jobs from my work. Like you usually yeah, have to yeah, list yeah, the whole yeah, work yeah. history. I'm not going to just I put that out or put that. Yeah. I'm here, just going to put gonna these pick, other two yeah, positions yeah, yeah, yeah. and they're just going to be a gap of five yeah, years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, <laughs> don't worry about that. No, yeah. it's like, but you're picking everything. So what went, mm -hmm. what went into that process? Um, so when it comes to picking the work, it's more of, I have different sections in my, in my, at least in my website. So it's like, it's showing that I, um, like I have a street photography section, a concert section, and like a portrait section to show people kind of the different things that I can do. So I'm at this moment, I'm just putting out the thing that I consider to be my best work up there. I think it's, um, because it's like it's it's easy to for people to grasp what it is that you do if you if you have like the thing that you consider the best to be up there personally. Um, I do think that I have to tweak my approach towards it because I think I have to think more about what's the purpose of this portfolio, because I also don't think like if I'm being transparent with you, there's a lot of photographers that I know, especially photographers that are like in, that have been to school for photography or kind of just a little bit more in that. Um, that they have to like utilize their portfolio all the time. And I don't feel like that's something that I've had to do too much. Unless like there's certain people, they could go to my website. But like besides that, like it's not always the thing that gets me the gig because they, they might have they might have already seen my work already somewhere else, like on Instagram or something like that. So it's um, but but I think I have to tweak it to what's the purpose of this portfolio and why would anybody want to look at this portfolio? You know what I mean? So that leads into my question. You know, you got your portfolio. Mm hmm. What was like the first time? Because I think I think this is like depending on the industry and the type of art you're doing. I, I, but I still think it's a big moment, no matter what type of work you're doing. Mm -hmm. Can you recall, if possible, the first time where you actually like received money for a photo you took? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Oh, can you? Yeah, 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 right, yeah, please, remember, please remember, walk through that. The way the way you were just like, yup. Okay, oh, yeah, I'm like, yeah, okay. I know exactly what it is because right? it was like a big. It was a, a big one at the time. Uh, all right, so it was a big deal. Okay, that, that's a, good. It was a big deal because. I've never sold anything up to this moment, so it was. And this person wanted such a big piece, and I didn't sell a big piece for a long time after that. And and just um just to give some context, how long from you picked up the camera and started getting into it versus you made like how long did it take to make that first sale and like what led into it? What was the picture? Just yeah, go through the whole story. I think it might have been maybe over like a year, year and a half, maybe. Um, okay. And it was like somebody wanted. So it was, I had a photo of downtown. So like I went out because I was starting, I wanted to try different things. And I'm like, oh, let me try long exposures, which is like when you go out there, if you leave the shutter open for a certain period of time, it has to be on the, you know, it has to be on a tripod because you can't leave the shutter open if you're, if you're holding it because it's going to be all like uh, a blurry image. I'm sorry. I was just thinking what we were saying earlier. So, but like I was going, I went to a city to try this like new technique that I was like learning about. 
and I took a photo of the city that's similar to that one actually but I took a photo of the city and it's just showing and it's just because it's long exp- you know how like sometimes in photos it's like um, you see the light streaks from a car yeah yeah like, yeah, yeah, I, yeah the I, light and I like that, if, that effect yeah, where you yeah, see yeah, a highway that, and then it's like streaks of light rather than cars yep, and, then, and, and, and then, the water too it looks like it's like one like solid piece of yeah, water instead, yeah. of, instead of just like a, you know what I mean so at the time I went out and did it and I got a, I thought I got a really nice image and then I posted it on Instagram and some guy that I used to work with um, at Expressions, he was like, yo, he was like, I need this image from my house. I'm just moving to a new house with my family. He's like, I want a really big piece. And I was just like, I have no fucking Wait, wait was, this, was this the guy who wanted the piece for the wall? Is this the same No, this is oh, somebody no. else. Okay, this okay. was like the first, I used to work with him at Expressions. I used to be a manager at Expressions. Um, and he wanted this piece for his house. And I had no idea what the fuck to do. I was like, I don't even know how to approach, I don't even know anybody who sells prints. So I don't know how to look, go about this. And I, I ended up finding a, a website in Canada that was like doing printing. And it was a lot, it was expensive at the time. I think they were charging, for the size that he wanted, I think they, they might've been charging like 200 and something dollars or something like that. It was like a big size. So like I would have to charge, I didn't know what to charge him. I think I might've charged him 300 and something dollars at the time or something like that, which sounded insane to me. So I don't, I don't, and then, and then I remember I got it and it was like a big piece because it was three pieces. So it was like one, like he wanted like a big canvas. I've just kind of three pieces in his house. And that was like the first time that I sold something like, like that. But like, I didn't sell anything for a little while after that because it wasn't, I didn't know how to tackle it. And that seemed like so foreign to me that it wasn't until like I started doing markets that I started actually like selling stuff. And that was like, um, are you familiar with, oh, obviously, um, the daily note. Yep. Yeah. So like they, the first time I ever did a market was with them. So like, um, shout out to Kuj and Louie. Love you guys both. They like hit me up and they were like, they were doing some, I don't know if it was, a, it wasn't a poetry, it was like some artist event that they were doing at the time. And they were like, they hit me up, they was like, you should do, you should be a vendor for our stuff. And I was like, what? I was like, I was like, are you, are you serious? And he was like, yeah, you should just sell your stuff there. And I was like, oh shit, that's kind of, you know, I, at that moment I haven't thought about it just yet and I decided to do it. And it was, you know, kind of all been, all been going well ever since basically. So after that actually leads perfectly in my, the, the next couple questions I have, um, what was your first so that first market uh was that was that your first market the the daily note one the daily note was my first market i think the first market that had a huge impact on the things that i was doing um like like one little bit thing was um the providence flea cuz i was like a completely different audience now how, now providence flea um quick rundown for those who have ne- who are maybe outside of providence mm-hmm. if so thanks for listening to the show really appreciate it uh but providence flea I think it was on the waterfront and then it would like move indoors, but like yeah, it's a lot of different types of people selling all sorts of stuff, mm-hmm. art vintage market, clothing, yeah, art, yeah, yeah, art yeah. you know, mm-hmm. um, drawings, paintings, knickknacks, like you name it. Uh, what made you decide? Because I, I think like, you know, there's different ways. And I want to talk about this too. Like there's gallery shows. They're selling it direct on your website. Mm-hmm. What made you go? Yes. Artist market. Was it the experience from the daily note market? And what was that process like of like, um, I think sometimes people just don't simply don't know. Like, did you, did somebody say, Hey, you should do this artist market. Did mm-hmm. you think, Oh, this will be good here. Why did you think it would be, it would sell well there. What was the process of like, how much did you pay for a booth? Mm-hmm. How did you figure out the photos you're going to choose? Right. And you can't just like show digital things. Like you have to like frame them up so people yeah, can yeah, take them course. home. Yeah, yeah, like, a, did you frame them? Did you not yeah, frame them? Did you have different prices? Like, can you walk through all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, I had, I had no idea what I was doing. Like, not that I know a lot, but it's just at the time, I literally had no idea what I was doing. And the reason why I went with the Providence Flea is because I was a little familiar with them already. Um, okay. I, I don't think I saw they, it. They had a reputation. They had like, a reputation. And then I don't, I didn't know, I didn't know any photographers at the time that were doing that, like in the circle that I was in. So I, I was just like, oh, that could be a good opportunity for me to sell my work. Did they give you feedback? Like, hey, that is, that's a good idea. Or like, no, like it's gonna. No, and the feed, like who gave me feedback? I guess like other photographers, like oh, oh no, like I no, kept, you need to be I, in a gallery. I keep, it, like, I, keep it, I kept it all pretty close to the shop. Oh, okay, like, especially because okay. at that time, I wasn't around like a ton of like even like with those two people that helped me. There's only a few photographers that like I was like cool with, but there wasn't like a there's a big community out here now that was not the case at all back then. So like I feel like a lot of people were kind of on their own, except for like some of those landscape photographers that kind of like worked, kind of like moved around together. Um, but <clears throat> it was I looked it up and I looked I don't remember exactly how much it was. I'm sure it was over like sixty dollars or something like that at the time to get like a. A table because you get different type of 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 tables like a space you get like a bigger space or a smaller space. They give you the table, or you had to bring your own table. No, you bring your own table, so you have to bring okay. everything. So you have to like bring that. everything, including everything. like the little tent thing. Everything. If, if, you don't, if you don't have the tent, you are they're not. So doing you're bas- be, you're basically being sold a plot of. Well, I want to say land. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not <laughs> on the land, but you're basically being sold a plot of land <laughs> yeah, in a confined yeah. space, essentially. Yeah. 
and then the more land you want or the configuration or I'm, I'm guessing even positioning probably pay, yeah. plays a factor in yeah in, I mean, in but as well. they also tell you they also tell you the position and so like they tell you like you're going to be in this area you know you, you but i mean could you pay more money to like have the same size plot but be towards the front and instead of like the end you know because because like there's like a path you have to walk mm -hmm. so like is it like you know what i mean it's like is there like st strategy where it's like well if you're in the front you're gonna get more eyeballs so you're gonna sell more so I'm gonna, i'll pay more for that or is it first i'm just curious is from it first my, come from first what serve? i can remember it was first come first serve but i'm, oh, okay, I'm 100 gotcha. percent sure that not 100 but i'm very sure that there's people that have more pull than others there's people that draw more people than others they might be they might be smarter themselves thinking like oh this brings us more so we might put them like in this well, area yeah like like, you know, like, sense, like we think. know this vintage clothing guy Correct. that's hot yeah, right yeah, now yeah, let's yeah, put sure. them in the front Correct. like yeah. because so like all, and when i did it it was at it was in the the downtown near the water so yeah. it was like right outside so it was you know everybody tips typically like walks through i was like somewhere in the middle but it was it was a big moment for me because I sold like it was the most I've ever sold at that. I mean, it wasn't. I was unexpected how I was much. Say, did that, that shock you? Where you're just like, what the heck is going on? It, didn't, it shocked me in a sense of just under just being there and seeing how well it's doing. Um, because I just didn't know what to expect. And not saying that I was going in there thinking I'm not gonna sell anything. I'm gonna. I wanted to go in and sell something, but I also had no. I, I literally had no idea what I was doing. So like, I had fucking frames that weren't even like taped up properly. So like if anybody hung those up, some of them shit fell at one. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. You know, I just, I was learning as I go. Um, shout out to one, one of my closest friends, Jennifer, uh, Jennifer, I don't Jen. Um, she, um, so she used to work for, she used to work for a company, Moo. And she got me. Oh, I'm familiar with Moo. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So Moo does local like printing, printing service. Yeah, local printing service. Yeah. Shout out. You know what? I, I, I'm going to speak this into existence. I want to get like somebody from the higher ups of Moo. Like, cause there's like not a lot of like, I want to say Moo is a medium-sized business, but they're not like a CVS. Like CVS yeah, is yeah, a giant oh, no, corporation course, that's based course. in Rhode Like Hasbro is a giant corporation. Their, their, their quality, their stuff is so but good. But there's not like big companies that aren't giant corporations that you hear about. So Moo, mm -hmm. if uh, if you hear this, I want to I want to I want to interview somebody, somebody from, from your yeah. business. Yeah, somebody high up. Yeah, absolutely. Like you know, I'll I'll take I'll take the entry level person too. I, I have them all on. It'll the be door, interesting. That's all that matters. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> But uh, but my friend at the time worked there, and then she got me. I was gonna print out some. I was asking her for help because I was like, "You work for this printing company," and then she was like, "Oh, let me get it for you. Like, let me give me a few days, whatever." And then she, I sent her the photos that I wanted to get printed, and she did me she did me the favor for free. So like, she did it all for me. So basically, I didn't have to spend money on those first images because she gave me she gifted them to me. So then like, so that like profit was a little bit better for me because every time you you know you'd buy an image. At the time, I think I was selling them for like ten or fifteen dollars, like some of these images. So it's like you, you kind of it, it was it was all profitable for me, but it was just good to get exposure because it was people interacting with my work. And at this moment, there was so many people that were just there. There was so many people were people were asking me for canvases, people were asking me for certain things, and I was like, oh shit, this is kind of this this couldn't have gone any better. Like at that time, so it's um it's definitely something that I recommend for photographers if they ever looking to just you know sell their work i think it's good to put yourself out there as uncomfortable as it can be because those first days when you're there and people are looking at your work and they're like you could tell like they're not impressed and they just walk away like you just feel like this thing in your stomach but it's it does not crushing but it doesn't matter like it doesn't you know what i mean like it doesn't matter because people are, are the people aren't supposed to like your work like it's not you know what i mean like you want them to like your work but the idea of feeling entitled if i ever feel entitled then i'm wrong i'm not entitled to anything i'm not entitled to, for anybody to connect with this or anything like that i had somebody fucking spazzed out on me one time because i had a state house photo this lady fucking she's like i can't believe you're doing a state house photo you know how corrupt this government is and i was like man i don't really care right now well maybe to, well maybe you buy it and you throw like something you on and you and you it's a piece about corruption now you, like it's kind of subjective here's like, the thing if you don't like it i don't like it's like I'm sure, like, I could, I know what she means in a sense of, like, yeah, it's government, this and that, cool. But, like, why but is she mad it, at you? It's like it, getting mad at, like, the like the air ticket person when it, the airline fucked up. The, it's like, what but, are you going to, like, what are you? But to me, like, it doesn't, like, in my head, I'm just like, I just don't care because, because I don't care. Like, I don't, I don't care what you think. I don't know who you are. And the idea for you, to, like, you, she just saw my photo from afar because it was a really big image. So she, And we haven't even been open. Like, we're about to open. And she just got a chance to get in early. And she's like, oh, I can't believe you have a state house photo. This is now. I was like, it's a state house photo. It's not that hard to comprehend that people would want a photo from, the, from like, such a big build, such an important building in, in Rhode Island. So it's like, you don't have to agree with it. But I'm sure you, as an adult, you could comprehend why this might sell. And it's like, but she's just going off and... I don't really give a fuck. Like I don't really care. Like keep it moving, ladies. So it's like, <laughs> I feel like you just unintentionally. I think that's going to be like the title and the theme of the episode is is when 
not caring anymore gets you to actually motivates you to do the work. Oh yeah, a hundred percent. You have to not care. It's an interesting paradox though, yeah, because yeah, there's yeah. other people who make fun of people for like putting in effort, mm-hmm. but then when you stop caring is when you actually put, put in more effort. More effort, yeah. And it, and it's all once again, it's all perspective. It's all how you view it. You know, if I'm constantly giving attention to the people who give me, to, if I'm constantly giving attention to the things that I don't like, my life would be very different right now. Like I've been in moments in my life where I'm just like, I hate this, I hate this, and I'm focusing on everything that I don't like. Oh, I don't like the way he did this. I don't like the way he did that. I don't go like none of that shit. It's like it doesn't matter. I have to focus on the things that I like. To let them like inspire me in some shape or form, and kind of just like create from there, basically. Caring less and working more with Rafael Medina. That's gonna be the title yeah. of the episode. That's a man. That's a, I'm, uh, that's a good lesson to learn. That's, that's a good, that's a good a title right there. That's, that's yeah, gonna be a title and the yeah. interlude. Absolutely. Everybody's just gonna hear this coming a mile away now. <laughs> that's we're, what it is, man. We're just we're just fine. We're just manifesting just, titles at this you, point. You gotta just not care, man. <laughs> just certain things. You learn if you have, man. I learned from Mike. <laughs> my cat doesn't give. <laughs> this is a stupid, but. I'm like obsessed with like I love cats in the sense of like I love that they don't give a fuck about anything. They just do what they want. And I used to hate them with a passion when I was younger. I hated cats. But like once I got a chance to have one and then I learned and I was like, wow, he just does whatever the fuck he wants. Like he just doesn't give a shit. Like and it's that's the whole thing with me that I find inspiration anywhere. Like I allow myself to be inspired by anything that truly inspires me. So it's just like you gotta kinda take it for what it is, you know. So this is why no offense to anybody who owns cats, but this is why I the only cats I've ever liked were ones that acted like dogs, just so I'd be like, Well, at least the, the cat's not pissed <laughs> off all the time. They just they just seem angry. Yeah, it's like I, I com- it's like cat, what are you angry about? Because like you, I you need nothing hate, in life. Because I couldn't stand them for a good period of my life when I was younger. I completely understand when someone's like, I don't like them. And I'm like, I understand. Like, I, there's no way that you could have convinced me before. For me, it's not even a liking. It's just you know? like the cat just seems angry. Like, what the they, hell is the cat angry at? They just don't care. <laughs> they, I mean, there is, if there's one creature that they do not care, they don't care what you think. They don't care what you do. They don't care if you try to get their attention. And if I'm going to do this shit, they, they're like, I'm just going to do it. I don't care what you think. So it's like, I, I love the beauty behind that. Obviously, we're humans and we can't fully like just walk around and be like, I don't give a fuck about anybody. You know what I mean? But there's there's like something really nice about that that I think is important as an artist to to kind of learn from. <laughs> not to not to dive. At. I feel like feel like we're we've we've create we've unintentionally created a new podcast. Cats and Psy- Cats yeah, and Psychology. Man, yeah, yeah. man with, I'm with Jay you, and Ra- with Jay I'm and Raphael. You, they are fucking awesome, man. They are awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. My God, I, I need to save some of this for the people. Yeah, yeah. I need to create a Patreon just of random things I talk about with my guests that have nothing to do with the episode. Yeah. Uh, I, I, listen, listen, if this is. Raphael won't care, but I'll care. So uh, <laughs> at least for the, the integrity of this episode, if we if, if I've been veering too much off course, uh, a slight apology, everybody. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it back. <laughs> but um, so you've done, you know, you did your first market, you sold mm-hmm. your first piece, mm-hmm. um, first gallery show, because I think that's a whole different arena. Yeah, like you know, it's, even just versus paintings and sculptures. Or photography that's in a gallery show that's not just photography. Yeah, yeah. Um. So, what was your first gallery show? How did you? How did that? How did you? But what was that process like? Did you reach out to the gallery? Did they reach out to you? Was it part of a? Was it a solo show? Were you part of a group show? How did you pick which pieces? Did the gallery pick? Mm-hmm. Um. If you don't mind talking about the money part, meaning like. Who set the price of of, of the, pieces? the pieces you presented? Mm-hmm. How much money did you get? How much money did the gallery get? Mm-hmm. Did you maybe learn later on, like, oh, certain galleries are going to charge less, or certain galleries will charge like not charge less or more, will take less and or more because well, we're this gallery yeah, versus yeah, that sure. gallery. Can you walk through that whole thing? Because I I think that part's a little bit behind the scenes that I don't think a lot of people really even understand. Yeah, like, yeah. I fully. I've heard about it from other people, and I still don't. Yeah, get that, and, get I've been, that whole and I've been system. in, and I barely understand. Oh, okay, <laughs> so great! Like, but I'm gonna give you what I great. what I. Yeah, I'm gonna please give, give you us what, what I we know. know. Yeah, so I'm gonna give you what a little bit. But in a sense of, I think there's so many different galleries nowadays compared to at one point when it was like very. It seemed like it was very limited if you think about old, like back then in the '90s or something. So like nowadays, there's so many different ways to get yourself in certain spaces. I think um, the first. So like I don't know if this was the first one exactly. I just remember this one being the one that was really impactful to me at the time. It was when I did a gallery at the Waterfire Art Center. With oh, a, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, I, um, so it was like with a group. Again, I'm going to keep doing this to you. And, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, And But uh, can you explain Waterfire Art Center to those who have never been or just what that place is? Yeah, I mean, it's... I mean, it's basically a, a huge gallery, like in a sense of um, they. they but it's always, like the size of like a warehouse building. It is a, yeah, so it's like it depends on like where, like they have two, di- like they have that really massive place, and then they have the smaller place like right next to it as yep. well. So like a lot of the times, most of the work is done in that smallest place. Gotcha. That big space is just 
enormous. Like, yeah. it is just, there's no way you can kind of fill, you know, most people, one person can fill that up. So it's, um, and they're a big name out here. They do obviously involve with the water fire um, in downtown, which is like one of the biggest tourist attractions that we have, if not the biggest. Um, but so the reason why I got into that was all through this, um, this team called like the Vanda Guild. So I was like part of this like photography collective and shout out to John. I'm not sure if you know JP Whitley. Nope. John, yeah, I think I'm sure you've you've seen him before around or something. Um, I, maybe you know it's one of those like if I see the person I'm like oh 100%. okay I know who that yeah, guy yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys are definitely moved in the same circle in the similar circles. But he he created um, him and this other photographer named D created this this collective called the Vanda Guild, and it was like for black and brown photographers to kind of just like work together in this space and stuff like that. And um, I met I met him I met John when I went to do. I went to do this um, studio session where it was like you could pay to get in to like shoot people at a studio session. It was like models that they paid that paid to get in. So it was like everybody could get like build up their portfolio and stuff. So I met him there. We already kind of followed each other on Instagram and we kind of just, just stayed cool. And then after that, shortly after that, um, when he went, he was saying that he wanted to create this thing. He wanted us, me to be a part of it. So I was like one of the first photographers that was like part of like that whole like organization. And it was it was cool because very shortly after they got this opportunity with the Water Fire Art Center, like literally within less than a year of being present, like they got this opportunity to to do a gallery at the Water Fire Art Center. And it was um that was like the first time that I really had my image like somewhere like that. And it felt like it felt like a huge deal. And to this day, I'm always extremely grateful for that opportunity. Um, he they ended up using my image for like the main photo, which I wasn't aware of. So like when I walked in the first day, I see all the flyers with my photo. And I see like my photo the first one when you walk in. I was like, holy shit. I was like, I was not expecting that at all. So that was like, that was like a really big opportunity for me at the time. And, and then when it came to, you know, when it comes to pricings, every gallery takes a percentage. Like there's no way around that in a sense. So like if you're doing it in a gallery for the most part, unless it's like a very smaller, like a smaller place, they're going to take some type of percentage. And I think, I don't remember at the time if it was like, you know, I think the usual is like 20, 30, some places do 40, depending on how big the gallery is. Um, but they were going to take a percentage, but I set my own prices too. Um, real, not to interrupt, yeah, but real, sure. real quick, what did, um, not saying it wasn't justified, but like, hey, we're taking this percentage. What did the gallery provide and do besides like giving you the setting and like, here's the wall to put it on? Like, so the what did they, what, like, what, what, what were they responsible for and what were you responsible for? So, I, realistically, I was just responsible to get them the images because after that, somebody from the Vanna Guild, um, actually, um, helped us uh frame it i believe oh, so, okay like, he helped it like john like and then they, they helped us out in that in that form and then once we give them the images like they do all the hanging they do like they took you mean the out. images in the frames in they, the frame correct yep. yeah so like they do everything like they at least in a sense of like they hung everything up they're the ones who kind of just decide on how things are going to go because they were working directly with john at the time but they didn't decide like oh the images need to be this format or this size or anything like that like they're just like um, hey here's your space that's in it a, in a sense of like um they're telling us like unless i'm mistaken this was a few years ago but it's kind of like oh the images can't be bigger than this like they'll tell you it can't be bigger than a b or c you know they don't want your images to be massive because they're trying to fit in they're trying to fit in other like people's work and things like and that you yeah. have like a certain amount of space you know yep but it was like um so that's why so in that aspect they was able to control that but besides that they put everything out they promote everything too so like i really don't have to do obviously i was promoting it but like they're the ones who are in charge of promoting everything and you were there. setting the prices not them i set the prices yeah not is that the system. norm or or at least from what i've what i've experienced oh, okay, i've okay. also seen sometimes where people might be like i've been in a gallery where people be like oh they just don't want anything higher than six hundred dollars or nothing higher than four hundred like depending on what it is so at that moment you could determine depends on the show if they wanted to make it more correct. affordable yeah, yeah. And it depends on that like obviously if it's like in at that moment you could determine if it's worth it for you or not you know because you as an artist you have full control over the decisions that you make so it's like if you don't think that's worth it for you then that's cool because if like if you wanted to charge more because they were going to take a bigger piece or whatever it is how you like kind of like how you see it but once again me being new at the time None of that stuff mattered to me because I just, I wanted, it was a good opportunity and it was cool to have like such a, to be able to be creative like publicly and then just get so many people in there. Like I was at the, uh, I remember my set being like all inspired by like um, Kendrick Lamar's Damn album, like kind of just like the different like emotions that he has throughout that album. So it's like, I believe I remember naming all my images like from different songs from that album because the songs are just kind of like one word for the most part gotcha. on that project. And um so and a lot of times I think that was like shortly after all the protests and stuff that happened. So a lot of the a lot of the themes that they wanted was kind of a little bit geared more towards that, like some of like the protests that that was because going that was on. what was going on at the time. That was going, that was like kind of like the, the yeah that was the thing that was going on at the time. So it was um, 
So it worked out. I, I just happened to get an image that they liked enough to use as a main image like this. Uh, there was like this kid had a mask. He had kind of like his fist up and like there was like an, uh, an American flag behind him. And it was like literally like I just got lucky. Once again, you just if you're if you're observing, I just like saw him and I was like, oh, shit, you mind if I get a photo? Because I saw the American flag behind him. And then I took two images and that was it. And I didn't, you know, I liked the image a lot, but I didn't think much of it. And then when once they blew it up and once they put it in all their flyers, it was just really cool to see that. I, I was able to find the kid online and send him the and send him the information in case he wanted to go and see himself in this like gallery and stuff. So it was um it was a really good experience, man. It was I've worked with them a bunch of times with the Waterfire Art Center, but that was my that was my first time working with them at that time. I was gonna ask another question about access, but I think as we touched upon the subject, it's too poignant not to ask right now. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'll preface this question, uh, with an example. Um, and it's not the most perfect example because I don't know every little detail of, but it's something just come. So if anybody knows this example better than I do, feel free to correct me on it. I am saying this just to kind of preface the question. Mm -hmm. So I think it was for years, like there was an issue with Kodak film and how it represented, um, basically people who weren't white Mm -hmm. because, and the problem was, and this is like you can fast forward to now with like AI image models being trained, like having a bias, bec- and the model has a bias because <clears throat> the person training it had a bias. Yeah, yeah of, course, of course. Intentional or not, human. it just, yeah, it yeah, just human. seeped it's, in. It's inevitable. So yeah. the people at Kodak, there was bias because most of them were white. So if they took a shot of a white person, it would show up fine. But then taking a shot of a, of a black person, like mm-hmm. the post process, it was just off, like uh, really oh. off. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know that I can that had an impact on how I, I want to say globally because I'm just thinking more in the American sense. But yeah, I'll, yeah, so I'll just I'll let, it probably did have an impact globally, obviously. But I'll just limit it to this for the example of this question. Mm-hmm. Probably had an impact on how African Americans, Black and Brown people, people of color viewed photography and mm-hmm. and viewed you know how they were being shot and how you know they were most likely being misrepresented intentional or unintentional because Mm -hmm. the bias in the processing reason why I give that example Mm -hmm. you brought up that hey the gallery at the time things were happening in the world they Mm -hmm. want stuff geared towards that even though I I think that was more of the Vanta Guild's decision okay that creative at least like that decision from my from what I could remember I think like they decided on a theme together and then they were like, oh, we have all of these photographers have these type of works. So right. we might be able to create something out of this image. Because it wasn't all just like that in a sense. Right. Know? A lot and, of it was portraits yep. and stuff like that. And the re- but the reason why that stuck out is, is mm-hmm. the reason why I'm, I'm mentioning these things is how do you think over the years, but how do you think like different groups view photography? Like, you know what I mean? Like, like their thoughts and like the way that they, they view photography. Mm-hmm. Do you think that that changes? It has to, I guess, from like different cultures and just how they view it and how they view its significance in that culture. Um, I guess another example to kind of like maybe flesh this question out a little bit more mm-hmm. is, um, you know, I've been DJing for a while mm-hmm. and it was Sabrina who explained to me, shout out to Sabrina. Sabrina, um, legend. Hey, like understand that for certain people in certain cultures, the dance floor is a very sacred space to them. Yeah. So, and I, and I, and I just never thought about it that way before. I was like, Holy crap. She's right. I just, mm. it just never, like I've been here for years. Like it was sacred. Like it was sacred to me in the sense of like, this is something I love to do, you but I never course. thought about it that way. I'm like, Oh yeah, there's a lot of like, now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Like that makes a lot of sense. Like there's a lot of like cultural significance and history that goes into that, that mm-hmm. like the way a person from another culture even just approaches a party or a dance floor means something totally different than like me as a like yeah, guy yeah. what I grew but, up in. But it all depends how you it depends on how you raise the stuff around you, the things that you're accustomed to. Because, right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. like a so mixture of all the that, reason why I'm asking that question is like how how like have you noticed that like one culture or one group of people or like one ethnicity or like one part of the world views photography one way and then it's like viewed completely differently in another way with like another culture, another, mm-hmm. per, like, you know, another part of the world or not, another group of people, another ethnicity, another ethnicity. Um, I'm not sure exactly. I, I think that I, I have noticed that sometimes like with like, let's say like poor areas, like photography might be more of a documentation thing for certain things because it's kind of like documenting what's going on in your area, depending on, depending on who, you know, what you're accustomed to when, when you see in photos and things like that. Um, I think, 
from my personal experience, like in my family, like photos were always just like more of a family, like kind of just taking photos of family and documenting everything that was going on. So it's like so the view is pure documentation, it, not, it not more documentation, expression. but it's like capturing, you know, capturing these moments, these family moments that are that I look back now and just I absolutely love looking back at those photos. Like it's just when it comes to anything. I feel like at in the, in the end of it all, your family and friend photos are always going to be far more valuable to you than anything else will be. So it's like, that's how I've always seen it in my community, like in the Hispanic community. Um, nowadays too, I feel like with the internet, it's just such a big melting pot. I'm sure there is different things that people view it a certain, you know, a certain way. Um, but I think like, I think about the people that I, that I go out and shoot with today. Like, it's like, you know, we're all minorities for the most part, except for like two people or stuff or three. So it's like, I think it from my experience, that's just kind of the way that I viewed it. I don't know exactly how it would be from like somebody else's perspective, um, especially if you don't. You know, I think about are you familiar with Gordon Parks? No, but I, I guess the perspective thing was like you had that lady kind of flip out on you because you had a oh, picture. Okay. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, I like so, like I, like I like, and I'm just wondering, like, what informed that perspective? Like, you know, I mean, I'm just broadening it to like photography in general, yeah, yeah, and yeah, like yeah. like how different like groups of people view it because I can. I could see how like a person with money and access to the best gear is going to view it one way, and somebody who oh, doesn't have sure. that access yeah, gonna, so is going to view it a completely money, different for, way. They go for the best because they don't have to start with yeah. like the shittier camera. They could they could go for the best cameras. Yeah, so that's what I'm leaning to. It's, just, I mean? it's just like one one culture can view photography one way, and, yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah. and like maybe it's pure utility or something. And another view, culture can view it as expression. And I just and I wonder yeah. what goes into that. You know, I, I always just think it's like your environment and your community, what you're accustomed to, and and how it's used in your environment too, you know. Um, only reason I mentioned Gordon Parks is because he was, he's like, if you ever look him up, he's a, he's this a photographer. He's like the first black photographer to like break through so many things. Like he is a legend, like a, the epitome of being a legend in a sense of like, and he's like, he's done so many photo books. He's done, he started directing at one point. He actually directed the original Shaft. <laughs> so he's like the, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Like, so like, Damn. But he, he's known for his photography, his documentation stuff, his stuff in the fucking, I don't know what era was that. That was the 70s or the 80s. But, like, he was able to document places, like, in Chicago and New York, these really gritty places that a lot of these other way photographers didn't really know how to get in there and kind of just, like, maneuver properly. So, like, he was in there with, like... And even if they c could get in there, they may not... They, may, they, they, they may, may not, not They trust. may not even... But they may not even represent the subject well, of course, in a way that's different. truthful. Of course. Because they... And maybe not intentionally, but it's course. because they don't see that era like the way that somebody who's grown up in an area see that sees it that way i completely agree so it's like it's all you know he had a different mentality because he was poor he was homeless for a long time he's been through i just read his book like about a year and a half ago and he's been through like some shit so it's like he had a different perspective where he was a lot more kinder to these people like behind you know that were in front of his lens like he's not just like oh look at this gang member he's a fucking horrible person he's showing the whole scope of like the gang member with like either the fighting the cops all these things like how bad their environment is so like he came out here and just really just completely like showed america like what some of these things are and he got there's certain people that weren't happy with the way he was portraying it because they might have wanted him to portray it a certain way and again per perspective right like perspective. well why aren't you not of happy course. about yeah, this yeah. like so like, like what what all. is this person they're just they're 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 maybe there's a stylistic choice but they're documenting what's there like maybe you're uncomfortable because you don't want to yeah you don't want you don't, you don't, yeah, yeah. don't want to admit that there's problems of going course. on and that this exists so it's like it's all yeah and it's uh seeing seeing some of his old work it's, i mean some of his work in general it's just amazing um and i can't let me see he had what was i gonna say about his work he had Nah, I lost it. It was something. It was something about. I'll show. I'll show. I'll send you some stuff at some point. But it's, it's really. Um, like I said, he had a different perspective. So he's being kinder to the people compared to the other people who was documented that same stuff. And, and and he got. You know, they trusted him. Like they trusted him to be around these killers. Like the killers. Like at least like these like really intense gang members. Like he has some like really popular, um, famous images of these people that people wouldn't even dare to be in that area. But they found a type of trust in him because they, you know, for some reason, something about, you know, he was a very kind person. He seemed like a very kind person. And he was also really fucking good. So you also, I feel like when you're the first at something, you have to be really good because they're not just going to let, like back then, they weren't going to be like, oh, let's just let any black photographer be a photographer. I don't know if he was the first Times, but I don't know if he was the first black Times magazine photographer or something like that. But like at that era, you had to be like excellent to even pull through to kind of get like push through that, you know to get that door open. So it's like, I'm now thankful that you you're mentioning this guy. Cause now I'm going to go like, go. Yeah. Yeah. Up, no, he is. Stuff. He, if you look him up, you'll see, you'll be like, okay, this is some serious shit. <laughs> Speaking of that though, we're going on a tangent here, but, yeah, yeah. but like these were planned questions, but the tangent wasn't planned, but um, I got to keep digging into it. Cause I think it's just so poignant. What do you think goes into, how should I put this? 
what do you think goes into an iconic shot? And what I mean by that is like watching the documentary um, Art and Copy, and there's like there's about the iconic shot of um, I think it was Muhammad Ali on the cover of Esquire, but they had like arrows, mm-hmm. like like arrows going into him, and there's a big big target, and that was like an mm-hmm. iconic shot. The shot of um, Malcolm X with the gun in with the, the gun, That's yeah, been yeah. recreated for album yeah, covers. Yeah, things. Of course, nonstop. That's an iconic shot. Um, certain was images. One redo that album. Cover yeah, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Ricky Powell, and the only way I know Ricky Powell, and that's a whole other thing. I, I like, you know, um, he's elevated, but like the average person doesn't know who the like who the fam- they, they may know a famous director, but they won't know a famous photographer. That's a whole yeah, other yeah. can of worms. And even, even directors too. They yeah, they might know a famous director that's like. Like everybody knows Spielberg, everybody yeah, knows yeah, like yeah. the big names. But yeah. think about it's like a handful of big names yeah. and like a sea of like endless directors. So it's like I've learned that those type of feelings is kind of like the way it is for the most part. What do you think goes into that? Like, what do you think hmm. goes into those iconic shots? Do you like? <clears throat> do, do you think that they even become iconic in that moment, or do you think that they become iconic later on? Like even all the Ricky Powell stuff. Like I'm a, like just a huge fan of mm-hmm. like rap music and hip hop culture. Like mm-hmm. that's why I got into DJing things like that. So seeing like these Ricky Powell images of like Jonathan like, Minion too. Yeah, yeah. yeah like yeah, like yeah, you yeah. know what I mean like those like those images are really powerful. Like what do you think makes the shot iconic? Is it is it notoriety? Is it context? Is it it stands the test of time? Is it the subject, you know? Yeah, I always think it's a mixture. I think every image, every popular image is like popular for different reasons. Um a lot of times I do think it has for it to be popular when it comes out, I do think it has to speak to like I don't want to say the culture, but it has to speak to like life, like the way things are at that moment. You know why something might be more important. Why might why why it might hit? Because like everything is timing. Like if you re- if I release a certain image at the wrong time, like it just might not hit. But if you came out the right time, like that that should just might that should just might take off. You know, depending on what it is that you're doing. So I think a lot of it is timing. I, obviously, I do think the image has to be good. But even at that, that's like you know debatable because not all images have to be really great to be iconic. Some images, sometimes some images because you were the only one who was able to document it. That's sometimes that's good enough for certain things. Like, if, have you ever looked at? Um, you watched Dunkirk by um, Nolan. Yep. Yeah. So like, the the images from that um, from D Day. Um, the the those images are wild if you ever look into them because those images they got fucked up with a like I think when they were getting uh, shipped back they got messed up in the water. So every every photographer that was on that island like other images got messed up except for this one photographer's images that his was able to cross the line to the ape, the API, whatever it is. And they were able to develop them and they were like blurry. They were like shadow, like all the, the black was like really harsh, but it was because it was such a horrible experience and it was so gritty and it was so thing. Like it felt like to people, it felt like this is the reality of how it felt out there. And those are, those are the only images that we have from that era, from that particular time. So because I was able to make it his way back to us, you know what I mean? So it's like, I think sometimes, it could just be the timing. It could be if you're in the right place at the right time. You could be you could be documenting the right person, you know, the right moment. Sometimes it's it's like you just have to keep working, you know. Uh, quick question: mm-hmm. Your opinion on photos where people pose versus the subject matter doesn't know that they're having a photo being taken of them? Mm-hmm. Do you think there's advantages or disadvantages to either one? Yeah, yeah, huge. Like um, personally, I don't like posing for a photo i feel like it just doesn't feel mm-hmm. natural i feel like it's just like like if, uh, we're creating we're creating something that's not there to me trust me i'm extremely uncomfortable in front of the camera so i completely understand where you're coming from but, but also behind the lens standpoint i wonder if there's like oh no because like the more you can control then the, of course then like you know the, the better the shot may be so your your opinion from a behind the camera perspective like post pose. photos versus you know Taking a shot and that person doesn't even know you're taking the shot. I think it depends where you're going for. So like when it comes to street photography, most of most of my images are candid. So it's like I'm going I wanna capture the moment as it's happening. And like I don't want to disrupt the moment either. So I'm just like aiming to capture something where you might not the more than likely you're not gonna notice that I captured it. And if you notice that it happens so quick that people are just like, Did that guy just take a photo of me? Like that's kinda like what people think. And they don't really react to it. I've only had like a few like negative reactions in the past. But it's like so I think it all depends. And if, if I'm doing like a portrait of somebody, like let's say I'm doing a portrait of you, I do think that I like stuff not posing, but I think it's, I also think it's a small crutch because 
I still feel like I don't fully understand how to pose somebody. So a lot of times I'd be like, oh, just do what feels natural. And it's like nobody really feels natural in front of the camera. So it's like, yeah, like this whole this this whole act is unnatural. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like I say that and it's kind of like a cop out because I still haven't kind of figured that out. And sometimes like I'll pretend a little bit more. Oh, just get here. Do this. And in that process, like I'm fucking I am improvising. And in that process, I'm like, please figure something out. Like, I'm just like, let's come over here. Let's do this. Let's move you. And then like, you know, a lot of times we kind of figure something out. So, um, so it's like. I think it depends what you're aiming for. For my street photography, though, most of it is, un, you know, unposed because I'm just capturing the moments that are happening. Unless I'm doing street portraits, which is a big thing for me right now, where I'm just like, I'll go out in the streets and I'm just like, hey, would you mind if I take a photo of you, this, this, and that? And that, to me, there's like something really special that I haven't, I've tapped into this year more than I've ever have, but I know there's something much deeper and much, much more special that I'm going to keep going because I feel like there's something at the end of that road or in that road. I'm not sure. I don't think there's ever an ending point, but. Um, actually, it's going to ask this later, but I'll ask it now. What are some of the legalities around street photography that I, that like, cause I've heard so many stories now about like, you know, people taking a picture and then the person being like, I didn't want my picture taken. Yeah, I'm suing yeah. you. Things like that. Like, like, especially if we're, if we're, we're in a day and age where anybody can be turned into like a meme mm -hmm, and, course. and possibly have their life ruined depending on how that meme goes. And they didn't ask for that. Like yeah, they didn't, they're just like, my new or people like trying to shoot viral stuff and like people don't want to be involved. Mm -hmm. What are some of the legalities around street photography? Um, you know, whether a person is posing or not posing, like what are some of the legalities uh, that people may not know about? Just like, just from a, you know, CYA cover your ass, please don't sue me. Standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. I understand. Um, from a, <clears throat> um, when it comes to street photography, if you're in a public space, legally, I could take a photo of you. Like it's that simple. So it's like, I don't have to explain anything to you. I could just say, if you're out there in the park, right? If you're like walking down the street and I go up to you and take a photo, granted, it's not going to be the best interaction, but can I, you legally make money off that photo? So I think that's where it can get tricky. I think, I think, I don't know exactly, but I'm, I'm, I think that it's like, if you're selling that photo off the likeness of this particular individual, that's, uh, that could be something different than just like you're selling this photo because it's like an image. And it's like, you know, learning to prove that in court has to be something that's like a little bit harder, a little bit more difficult, I think. So I don't know exactly beyond that, but I know that like with me, when it comes to like taking these images and stuff legally, I can take these images. Um, I just try not to be an asshole about it, like in a sense of. I still think it's a privilege for me to be able to take photos of other people. This is mass move, by the way, the way, like everything's just turning on. <laughs> um, I, I still think that there is, um, I still think that there is a, I try not to be an asshole. And if somebody's really offended or something, I don't mind. Like, I don't mind deleting the photo. Like for the most part, like I don't, I've never had an, I never had a situation where I was like, man, this photo is so good. I have to do it. Like, you know what I mean? Gotcha. So it's like, I had a situation one time where I like, I shot a couple and I don't typically shoot couples. And I was like, man, I really like this photo. I was like, I want to, um, I want to post it at some point. And then I, and then I think Valentine's Day was like three months away. I was like, oh, whatever, I'll just wait. And then when I went to post it, they like broke up and she was like, would you mind not posting it? Have you ever, then, have you ever run into legal trouble? Cause I, I've, mm -hmm. I've heard so many like stories about, there was one gallery show where there was a, I think it might've been like some of the suicide girls. I'm not sure if anybody mm -hmm. doesn't know who the suit, like it's like alt rock punk. I don't even know if that site or that group stuff, but it's. It's Playboy for the alt rock punk rock set is like gotcha. the best way I can describe yeah, it. Yeah, if yeah. if anyone's wondering, but like the peep, like the models who were involved were posting on Instagram, and then another guy who called himself an artist like took screenshots of their posts on Instagram and like made these big canvas things and did a gallery show and made a ton of money and That's gave cool. none of the money to the models, and he was saying, "Well, this is my artistic expression. I don't have to pay him anything." And so that was like a whole weird legal battle, like because it got into a weird, like it seemed very cut and dry to the public. But then, like when you when they were actually diving into like the legal framework of it, like it got really weird. And then, um, you know, I know some photographers get people to like sign releases, so they yeah, don't. So that's one thing. So I, they don't think. I, and then, I've, like I've been told by big photographers, you should consider getting signed release if you're ever going to post somebody's like portrait in a book or something. And Ooh, then also on top of that, like <coughs> I think there was, I think there was, uh, it was it might have been recent. And correct me. You can correct me if I and also if, if I get this wrong, audience. Um, please forgive me. But I think there was also a recent thing where like the iconic Jay Z photo that that um, God, I'm blanking out on the album now. Reasonable doubt. Yes, because it was it was that particular photo as well. No, yep, yeah, yeah yes. Okay, so that photo was going to be used like in an NFT project or something, 
And then he was like, well, it's my photo. I never agreed to it. And then it's like, well, you don't own the photo. Like, unless he, that's the thing. I don't know if he paid to own the photo. Right. Like, you know yeah, I mean? there, like, there, so there was a whole, that's, there, that's like a thing too. There, that, like, and I think it's, I, I don't know if it's still ongoing, but it was, there was like a, like who really owns the photo, yeah, who really yeah. owns the rights. And it's like, but you're taking a photo of a person who has a likeness and a brand. Um, that's all through contracts. Like a, that big gallery. I just did a gallery in downtown. That's definitely the biggest gallery I've done. And that's like, yeah. Can you detail the, that contract, a little bit? Cause I, yeah. I think there's like weird legal gray areas with <laughs> photography that peep like that. It's just like, I, Oh, I, 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 that's wow. That's really I, I always interesting. Think it, I always think it depends on what the contract is. So like, okay. in the, like in the contract that I, like when I did it, I have this um, gallery at 100 Westminster in downtown and it was very specific. Like they were like, uh, cause I was working with the Avenue concept and they're just like, you're going to still own the rights to these photos. They don't want the rights to any of these images. I think the only I did an image for them that they wanted that they wanted the rights to because it was specifically for them that I created this image for. But besides that, it's like I think if you guys have it worked out throughout the contract, and I'm assuming at a time when fucking Reasonable Doubt came out, there was no there was no contract. Them dudes are just going up to this place, take photos, and keep it moving. So it's like it has to be kind of like a, a it's more, like oh I got paid, but then, but it's like area, you know it's like well, but I but I, now here now here's a question you said back then right because these stories come out on you know social media and that they're being publicized do you think photographers now are like going into these contracts going no i want to own this like i don't care if i'm sh i don't care if i'm shooting drake for a photo shop. i want to own part of this because i know it's going to make some money possibly someday i think it depends depends how much leverage you have i think depends okay on, you very know what true I mean? like, very true depends how much leverage you have if you're if they're just like we're giving an opportunity to shoot drake and you want to own the photos get the fuck out of here we then we just don't we don't need you like in a sense that, and all depends but, on it, the but, it, but, it, but if it's the guy who shot jay-z you know what i mean for so, reasonable yeah, that's yeah, a different yeah, story yeah. So like although he shot jay-z specifically for that album and once again i don't know what the, i'm sure there was no contracts back in fucking 95 or 96 whatever it was so you know, that's a whole different story where there's still that gray area where so many years pass. I'm like, who really owns this image right now? So, but like something nowadays, there's a lot of photographers that are very smart with like at their approach to these things where it's like, I need to make sure I still like own all this stuff. And it's, I think that's very important. Like whenever I do anything, I have to make sure I'm not giving people the rights to anything. These are my images, unless I'm doing, once again, that, that thing, I did an image for the hotel that was next door to the, to this gallery spot. So I was working directly with like this company who owns a hotel so like this was specifically for them they were going to have the rights and stuff but i went in and agreed with that because it's like you know that's fine with me every all the other images are actually my images so i wasn't afraid of 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 just not you know i needed to just make sure i, I maintain those rights now speaking of you know we, we we're on the subject of music so i think this actually that i thought we, i was going to be able to bring this question up it perfectly rolled right <laughs> into it you know we're talking about these iconic images from mm -hmm album covers and things like that who owns the rights um you love music obviously yeah. we were talking about that earlier and, and you know you were um you wanted to do concert photography because of that love for music mm -hmm. however i am pretty sure because you're getting like close enough to the artist to take a good shot of them mm -hmm. uh you can't just you can't just walk in there with a camera no at, at any given concert be like i'm gonna take a shot of this person yeah no I, you could walk in with a type of camera so that's that's the thing so like you could walk in with a point and shoot camera but and not like the, not you know, like a, the <clears throat> not like the big professional camera that you can remove the lens. But you can walk in with a camera that's a point and shoot, and they're so powerful nowadays that depending on where you are, that's like you could get a pretty good shot. Like um, there's this very famous shot of Kendrick. At some con I think it was for the damn concert, and he was wearing his all red suit. He's like he's like um, kneeling down, and that sh like that shot was taken by this photographer named Henry, that's like from Canada. But he didn't get permission to shoot Kendrick at that moment. Like, he wanted to shoot Kendrick, and he didn't get permission to shoot Kendrick. So, like, he had tickets front row seats already. So he went and bought out this point-and-shoot camera, sat in his front row, took this shot from it, put it on Instagram, and that's the shot that they used. Like, they just, like, somebody found it, that sent it over to Kendrick's camp, and then they used that. And, then like, they, like, they used that image, I believe, for, like, either, like, the con or something like that. So it was, like... Because he was a, because he was proactive enough to do that, you know, I, I've done that before myself with like Kali Uchis. I'm not sure if you're familiar with yeah, Kali yeah, Uchis. know who that is. But I'm a big Kali Uchis fan. And back then, when she came out with her first project, I saw her in Boston, and I was like, oh, I'm bringing this point issue that I have like good range with, and I got really good images. This is all very brand new. I think I've only done a few concerts at the time, but to me, I was like, oh, this is cool that I'm, I feel like I'm kind of here in some shape or form. You know what I mean? At least like shooting them, and even if it's for myself, because I'm like trying to get the practice in. You know? Now I've seen your concert shots. Can you walk through the process of though of like actually being allowed to like you know what I mean like oh you're one of the photographers that's like <clears throat> being paid to shoot that artist mm -hmm. or that concert can you walk through the first time that that happened how was that set up did you seek out the venue or the artist did they seek you out mm -hmm. was there a contract like 
were there rules like here's what you can do here's what you can't do like mm-hmm. um you know can you walk through that because i i think that's another one too it's like how do you, you know hey i want to i want to shoot these legendary music artists in the cons how do i gain that kind of access so you, like do you, you know yeah how does I, that work if i'm being honest with you i completely despise all of like the the back end stuff of concert photography like I think it's so okay. And let's let's that. Why? Yeah, yeah. Why? Why? I'm gonna, why, gonna, I'm gonna why? tell you. I'm gonna tell you why. Because it is all like it's more about who you know on a lot of things. So it's like <clears throat> put it this way: when I first started trying to shoot concerts, which was back in maybe 2019, I think that's like when I started taking it a little bit more seriously. I, t- I did a few in 2018, but then I remember I was trying to shoot concerts, so like I was like, I don't know what the fuck to do. Let me hit up these venues. So I hit up the venues and like everyone's like, no, like I, like I had no work to prove to them either. So it's not like I would fucking turn me down, too, because it's like, bro, you have nothing to prove. And you want to ask to shoot these events, not knowing that they would have turned me down more than likely regardless, because I have to go through somebody else to get to, into these events. Right. So it's like I have to go through either the manager, the publicist or something like that, depending how big the artist is. There's certain small artists that you could direct hit. hit a, so is it the artist that determines or the venue that? Because like, what if the no, venue it's not wants? The venue. It's what, not, oh, so I, I, think, I wonder. I, I, I wonder if the, the venue wanted something. You know what so I mean? I think, but it's, I think, it is the it, artist. So I think it depends on the situation. I think, oh, okay. I think the artist has way, most of the control. The artist has most of the control. Like for, for example, when I one of the most important shows I've ever shot to me was Pusha T. I shot Pusha last year, and it was a big deal because I love Pusha T. Like, I love clips. Those are some of my favorite artists. I, one of the first concerts I ever went to was at the Strand when, when it was Lupo's. I saw the clips there for Hell Has No Fury with Jabron. So it was like... <clears throat> But so it was like a big deal. For I was me. at that show, so you had that I, show I too. That, yeah, I oh, bro, show. what? I got them. I, had I went the, by myself. I was like, I couldn't buy anybody. I'm like, I'm going. I want to see. Yeah, Pusha. yeah, yeah, man. It, I mean, I had the because t- it was one of the first shows that I went of like artists that I was like really loved. And, and it, was it was also in a venue that was not like the Dunkin' Donuts Center. Yeah, and it's, which it's, gives it's which much, gives you more of an intimate more feel. Intimate. Of course, I saw Nas there, and I remember yeah, seeing Nas yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, I saw Nas there twice. Yeah, we were probably at the same show. We've been to like all the same shows, and then like for that for like this Pusha show. Like, certain artists are much more particular on who they let shoot. So, like, sometimes if you're shooting a really big artist, <clears throat> more than likely they're only going to let you shoot three songs, and that's it. You get the first three songs, and you're done. You have to leave after that. If you're shooting a really big artist. So, like, certain, like there's certain, certain venues are, like, certain venues. So, like, for example, so, like, when Pusha came here to, to The Strand, I, my, so I work with this team called Red Eye Entertainment. Shout out to Red Eye I love you guys. They've given me all the big opportunities. Like most of the big artists that I've ever shot has been because of them because they do. Vi- so you went through an entertainment company. You yeah, weren't, yeah. you weren't dealing directly with, with push, the with, the with the push stuff. Wait, well, I guess, it, with, I guess yeah, the, for example, yeah, sure. a lot of stuff at the strain is directly with them. It's, a, it's okay. directly because they work with the owner of the strain. So it's uh, like, okay. yeah, yeah. So because they work with them, they're doing the videos. I've worked with them before. I've known them for a few years, but I worked with them before and they, and they like my work and they always show a lot of love. So they're just like, yo, if you want to come by, you would come with us, like, you know, and you'll be able to at least like get what you want out of these shows. And that was a big opportunity for me because at this moment, back in 2020, right before everything happened, I was like shooting, I was just shooting all local acts only. So it was like, in 2019, I shot like 20 something local acts, like 30. I was like not, and I don't care what was going on. I see a hip hop show. But but you were you were going to do it, and were you getting paid for everyone? No, or were you just like get, offering to do it for free, and then if free. they liked it, hey, there great, is, use it. If you're getting, yeah, it was it was free because I needed the experience. Like you need to get the repetition. I needed in, the experience, that, and I needed uh, I needed to focus on the work, and I needed things. So to me, that was the most important thing. And it's like, so like, but like to so fast forward to the Pusha T show. When I walked into the Pusha show. I'm on the list with Red Eye, like with them, and then they're like, um, they were like, oh, Pusha's like, they're very strict with it. They wasn't gonna let anybody, that they're not letting anybody shoot Pusha. They're like, you can come in and shoot all the opening acts, but when Pusha comes in, you have to leave. Like, that's what I was told. And, and who <laughs> set that precedent? That was. They told me at the front, but that precedent was already set from, Push, from Pusha's for, camp. So, so, this brings up a logistical question, mm-hmm. not, not to interrupt, but like, who, then I guess, who really determines who the photographers are gonna be for that? Because. It brings up a logistical question of, well, then why doesn't Pusha or his camp hire a couple of photographers <coughs> that they know, know and or trust and just bring them on, like, almost they like do. roadies? No, they do. Okay, but, yeah, then, yeah, but, but, they, they but do then there's also photographers in every city that are not those people, obviously. Yeah, so, so like, like the, the venue, they allow the venue to shoot with, uh, up, up to a certain, uh, I'm assuming there's like, it's different for, very, for every artist, but like certain artists are just much more strict with like, oh, you guys, oh, okay, we, don't want any okay. of your, we don't want any of your photographers shooting our artists. Like, and realistically, the artist is like the, the money, so it's like they do whatever they need to in that sense, and I understand that too. So it's like with the Pusha stuff, when I walked in, I'm excited to shoot Pusha, and they're telling me like, <clears throat> they told me off the bat, like, yeah, this is different from when you usually come. They're like, this is... You're not gonna be able to shoot him. Shoot him entirely. You're not gonna be able to shoot him at all. 
And I was like, fuck. I was like, man, this would have been like a big, big win for me. And then I just I just happened to get lucky. Right place, right time. I'm like walking in the venue. The owner of the venue is there. I've gotten cool with him because he really likes my work. So like he's like a, a he's like a big fan of like the the work that I produce for like like the artists that he that he has. So he was like, oh, you're he's like, oh, you're trying to shoot Pusha. And I was like, oh, yeah, I was like and then he was like he was like, they're being really strict. But let me see if I could get something, you know, and honestly, everything's with timing, man. Like he was like, look for me once he starts and we'll see if we could figure something out for you. And like Pusha started two songs in. I'm like, man, I don't even know where the, the owner is. And I'm just like thinking this is like kind of not going to work yeah. out. And then like <clears throat> I see the owner get behind a bar and I was like, oh, shit. And I go up to him and tell him. And then as soon as he sees me, it was just a coincidence. One of Pusha's people was like walking by. Like it's, I don't know if it was his manager or somebody important from Pusha's camp. And he like looked at him. He was like, he was like, oh, he was like, let, let him in the pit. He's like, let, let him shoot the thing. And the guy was like, oh, cool. Like the guy just like kind of just allowed it. He didn't push back. And I got in the pit. So it went from like, <clears throat> don't you, you dare do anything do yeah, yeah. to like, oh yeah, go yeah, for it. So like, like, that's, a, that's such a weird 180. <laughs> when it comes to when it comes to artists, bro, like I expect all that inconsistency. Like I can't go in there expecting they have to be a certain way, you know. So it's just like. I've learned that there's so many pieces to that puzzle that I just, I don't have. There's so many layers. There's so many layers to it. it. it, um, This is a better reference. So it's like, so it's like, I don't have control of all of that. I just hope that I can. And to me, unless I'm shooting the artist and we're like two songs in, then it's not, it's not a sure thing. Like, I don't really brag about things that I might have until like, I'm fucking done. You know, I'm done with the whole process. So it was like, they kind of let, he seemed to be fine with it. They let me in. And then I was the only photographer shooting Pusha. So for me to be in that pit by myself, I know damn near every Pusha T song you can possibly think. So me in the pit by myself, I am fucking feeling like I am at this concert for myself. Uh, Pusha's performing for me and I'm taking all these photos. And it was like, that was like a, that was an incredible experience within that. But it's like, but it was just telling you to show you that it's like up and down. Like a lot of times, like a lot of that work isn't paid work until you get to a certain stage, until you get to a certain place in that industry. And I feel like there's still like a lot of things and I'm like learning how to, um, how to really kind of grasp. Um, I got a really big opportunity this summer when I shot the New Newport Jazz Festival. That was like a huge opportunity. The biggest... I was at the that biggest, Newport yeah, Jazz yeah, the Festival. Biggest, the, right. the biggest concert opportunity I think I've gotten to this day was shooting the Jazz Festival because... I was working with an action like I was working with an actual f- team of photographers where they do this professionally. Like these photographers work for the New York Times and all these big other places. So it's like I'm working with an actual team where like constantly communicating, making sure you got this, this, this and that. And I went in as an intern. They 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 didn't have any spaces for a photographer, but they had they just created this new like thing for like for people to kind of help out a little with the load off the photographer. So it was like an internship. And I was like, "Yo, anything I can get my foot in the door." So it's like I took that and it was Three days of the the most I've ever worked in in concert photography in my life, and but it paid off because I've been able to kind of keep a good relationship with those people. I just did I just did something for them like two months ago at the Blue Room in Cranston because like they started doing like jazz there every t- two times a month. I did hear about that, yeah. Yeah, so like it's the first for my understanding, it's the first time they did something out of the jazz festival, but it's like they're doing it like twice. I think the second and fourth Wednesday of every month, and like they reached out to me. So I could go and shoot shoot the open at night. And like, that's paid work. When I did the jazz festival, that was paid work. So it's like, this is all with contracts and everything, too. So it's like, this is all, like, very, like, it's going, like, I feel like I've gotten a lot of wins in that this year, um, towards the end, at least, because I, I've gotten some major losses. Like, the biggest losses I've had this year with concert photography <laughs> has been, like, it just, I, I, I got an opportunity to shoot Lil Wayne one time in Boston. Bro, we shoot, we're, we're all there. A bunch of photographers are there. We're all in. We're shooting on the opening acts. We're waiting for hours. Everything's cool because we're just staying. Um, Victor was there from Complex. Oh, okay. So okay. he was there because he was like doing his like stuff for like his show. And we were doing it with like, with like, I, like Euro because they're like from out here and stuff. So they got me an opportunity. We're like there. And then I remember like I just lost, like I'm there waiting for hours. I'm already tired. I just got out of work. I got the opportunity last minute. So I rushed from work to go. And then. Wayne's about to come out, and right when Wayne comes out, literally the moment he comes out, his team just comes out. Everybody get out the photo pit. It was like, bro, we've been waiting for hours. What are you talking about? And he's just like, they're like, I don't care. They wanted this whole thing cleared out. And then, like, I was only able to shoot from afar, and I didn't have the proper lens to shoot from, like, really far. Oh, and God. it was like, so, and, you know, I was grateful that I got a free Wayne show. You know, it was cool. That was a cool opportunity to see. He performed a lot of stuff that I wasn't expecting him to perform. But... At this very moment in my life, I just needed the work. Like, I was, I was happy to, you know what I mean? Like, I wanted to be able to have this portfolio, like, to have this under my belt. And then when it didn't pan out, like, I was just really disappointed with it. Like, um, and that happened, like, two other times, too, this year. So, it was, it's been a tough year. So, I'm happy those, like, the jazz festival stuff kind of felt like a really big win for me at the end of it all. So, 
I think this leads into more of the money type questions and um, I'm going to be real blunt on the first one because uh, I think it'll help set the stage. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, you're listed as a freelancer. Do you make your main income off of being a freelance photographer? Yeah, d- definitely not. Yeah, yeah I, I do. Um, <clears throat> so I still have a job. I still work part time. Okay. So I work 32 hours a week. I work a retail job. Actually. Okay. Yeah. So it's. So that's like still my main thing in a sense. Um, photography has just gotten like I've been able to make more. Like this year was like my most successful year financially with photography. I think. Um, so it's so it, because there's like the, the, I have to get better at, at monetizing it, and that's like my main goal for next year is like being much more cleaner with it. Like, you go on my site, you could just you know print. You know you could order a photo for yourself. You could do certain things on yourself. I, I'm I'm I have to. I'm usually every uh, I'm usually the person behind all of that stuff. Um, so it's like I have to find ways to just kind of like let it go on autopilot for certain things. And it's like that's like the main focus next year. Um, so with with that being said, are you set up from a revenue standpoint of like. So you're obviously doing contracts with these venues and these artists. So do you have like an LLC set up? Like, are you a sole proprietorship? I'm a sole proprietorship now, even though the LLC is coming next month okay maybe by the end of the, yeah so llc has been like a very big focus that i've been looking into more recently because i want to just kind of make that jump like it also re- gives you more protection too 100%, like like wait because if they sue me they could sue the company they're not they're not suing me directly so right it's like, where, you know where, but I mean? if it's sole proprietorship they could sue you and take your personal assets that's what i'm saying that's business what i'm saying assets. versus my business assets so it's like I've, I've been able to speak to a few people and i just hooked up with a friend recently that he kind of told me that he's you know he does all that kind of stuff so i'm happy that i'll be able to get some type of work or some type of help from him but were we going to ask something? Well, I was going to say, when was the moment that you even decided just to do a sole proprietorship? Because I, you know, like, was that out the gate when you, like, was there a point where you're like, oh, I need to set this up so I can get paid properly? Or were, like, were you getting paid? And then, and then, or did somebody try to pay you? And then you're like, oh, yeah, just make the check. I like, no, we need, like, tax forms. Like, you know I what I mean? I think it's more of that. Ha- even though, like, they don't, there's, there's certain businesses that I work with that I have to give them, like, a W-9 and all that stuff. So those makes me feel like, man, I got to get my shit a little bit. I got to get my stuff more in order because I feel like I've been doing it for so long that I feel it's like, well, I need to get paid too. I need to get paid. Well, you know, and it's just like, and it also feels more professional when you're now, like I've, I've had the opportunity to work with like some bigger companies this year. So like, I want to, I want to make sure that I'm representing myself properly in every aspect. You know, um, there's a lot of mistakes that I've made, obviously. Um, and, but I think I've, I'm getting a little better and better at just kind of like handling this stuff a little bit. So I'm excited for, I'm really excited for what's to come next year because I think that it's going to, I'm already working on it now. So it's just like, you know, continuing to kind of just like move forward with that. You know, so you are a freelancer and you have money coming in. Um, How do you keep that money coming in? What I mean by that is like, what is the process of gaining new clients or continuously working with the clients you've already worked with are you constantly like reaching out and then seeing the gigs or the things that stay Mm -hmm. are people coming to you that you're now gaining more of a more uh, more of a name more traction Mm -hmm. um do you find yourself that you have to reach out you still have to reach out a lot or do you think things are coming in more naturally can you expound upon that Mm -hmm. a little bit Uh, at this moment i feel like things have been coming to me a little bit more natural this year I think like the the reputation that I've built for myself in, in Providence, I've had um, people reach out to me a lot more this year. I work with, you know, I work with like stuff like with like uh, a lot of like the Providence events too. Like it's not just like with like small, like smaller companies I've, I've done with like, I just worked with Providence Tourism um, Council just like a, about a week ago. So it's just like, I think that reputation is kind of like gaining its momentum where people are reaching out and just, just like a lot of references. Like people are just reference, you know, um, people are just like telling other people about, you know, my work and stuff like that. Um, I have reached out to people and I think that I leave a lot of money on the table by not reaching out to people more. So that's like one of the things that I think that I have to, that I plan on getting better with because I think reaching out to people is like a big thing where it's just like, depending on what you want. So like, even like if I want, maybe I see my photo somewhere, I might, I could reach out to somebody, you know, depending on who it is that I want to reach out to or, or if I, or if I see something missing from like a business from like that aspect that could be like, Hey, you know, I could deliver A, B and C to you guys. If you guys, you know, but I have to have stuff to be able to present to them properly. Right. So I have to make sure that like I'm doing all that properly because I think that's where I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. Um, because besides the freelancing, you know, I make money for my books too. I make money for my prints. I still sell prints. I still sell my books. My books is almost, I'm almost pretty much done with selling my books. So I have like, I think like 15 copies left. So it's like, so 
I think all that stuff is what made me money. Um, despite when I, when I first released that book, that was like a big deal for me because it was like the money that I made from the book and just from that event itself was like, felt like a really huge win for me at the time. This was back in late 2021. We're going to get into that in a mm-hmm. moment. Um, when you do reach out, though, I know you're saying you want to do that more. When you do reach out, how do you pitch yourself? Because I think that's one of those things that a lot of people struggle with where it's like I was struggling with. I was like reaching out to venues like, well, how do I pitch myself yeah. as a DJ? Like, I know what I do, but I feel like this weird like it's hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's hard. Like, I feel like I'm bad at selling at like having the proper pitch to sell myself. Like, like, yeah, like, like how are you? You know like, what I mean? Like, yeah, I, I feel and like you, it's have more, you struggled with that? Yeah, like I, I always felt like I've always felt like I've had that problem because it's just like the idea not to be a guy, but like, I guess. I don't want to say it's bragging, but it feels braggy. So it's just like, so sometimes if you're not accustomed to being that way, to like do it in a professional manner, it feels like, it just feels very uncomfortable to be, you know what I mean? Like to kind of just like you're approach. Just like, uh, yeah, like this is what right. I could do, but I have to, you know, that's stuff that's, that's stuff that I've con- have to continue trying to overcome because that's, you know, all that, all that, that feeling is temporary. Like even like not, not being able to pitch to my, to pitch to people properly. I feel like that stuff is temporary because eventually I'm going to, you know, I'm going to be able to figure that out. And then I just kind of move on to the next thing. And it won't be something that I think about once I find like a formula to it in that sense. Because I feel like any time I've ever done it has been like random. Um, it's been a while since I've done it. So I kind of can't have something like off the top. But I think it's always kind of just I never feel like it's as consistent. Um, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> now, when you do have clients that you work with or you do gain a new client, maybe, um do you set the terms right away? Do they set the terms um, as far as like, how, you know, who sets the terms as far as how you get paid, when you're going to get paid, mm-hmm. when it, when the job is considered done? Mm-hmm. Um, and have you ever had a client or a job go bad where they completed the job and they're like, well, we're not paying you because we don't like it yeah, or something yeah. like that? Um, yeah. So can you can you uh, dive into that a bit? Um, so it depends what it is. So if it's an event, an event, um an event gig, like they're pretty straightforward for the most part. You know, they have a certain like a deadline that I that I have to meet or I could tell them that it's not going to work for me. or I have to like extend the deadline, but I'm pretty good with meeting deadlines. Um, so I don't really have too much of an issue with that. Um, and when it comes when it comes to like other stuff, I might have like, for example, the stuff, the stuff that I did in downtown, like the gallery stuff I did in downtown, like that was like they had they had lawyers. So like, we're just, I'm dealing with like this company, like this, like real real estate company's lawyers. And we're like dealing with them from like our end. And they're just kind of like, kind of just going through like the terms and stuff and just want to make sure that I, luckily the Avenue concept was representing me. So like they was able to kind of get everything kind of, you know, making sure that that stuff goes well for me. And I don't get, they don't get any rights to any of my images or anything else. And I get paid properly and stuff like that. So I think it always like depends on, on what type of gig that you're doing that you'll get that, that kind of like that changes if that makes sense. No, you ever, have you ever had a gig go sideways? Oh, so yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I, didn't say, I apologize. Yeah, yeah no, so no, like no, I no, have, feel free. I have, I have <clears throat> never, never that they weren't going to pay me, but I have in a sense of like I don't feel like that they like the images that much. So it's like I've had, I've had like I, you could tell sometimes when people really like an image or images. So like it kind of like the, depends on like how they how they react to it. Like if they're just like oh I love these or. Or this isn't now. Or it's just like, oh, do you have any more? Like, it's just like, it's like, what? I just gave you like everything that I just had. <laughs> so it's like, I've been there before. I feel like I've fallen short multiple times. Um, I think there's only like a two or three times. There was one time that I did a, like, kind of like a, I think it was like an engagement. Or it was like a, I think his wife was pregnant. And we did some photos, some maternity photos. And they weren't too crazy about it. Um, so it's like that stuff, you know, you feel bad. Because it's like, I want, I want them to like it as well. You know, and that, was, that used to be the thing that used to scare me the most when I first started doing photography. It's like, man, what if I do something and they don't like it? But it's part of the process. So it's like you have to take those L's and be like, okay, how can I change this for next time? Because I'm not going to satisfy everybody, you know, in that sense. Was there a – I'm trying to put this in the correct context. Have there been jobs or was there a job where, like, you took it and then, like, soon after you're like, oh, I shouldn't have taken this? Or – you know, in the beginning, were you taking any and all jobs and have you become more selective? Because I, I think there's some like no matter what creative field, sometimes there is a a danger of when you're taking any and every job, of course, of course. It, like that can actually hurt you more than help you. Yeah. yeah um, or you get, maybe get known for something you don't want to be known for. Yeah. Um, so how do you go about like, yes, I'll take this one. No, I'm not going to take that one. Um, so that's something that I had to, that, I, that I've had to tackle a lot this year. Um, just because I felt like I was taking, I was so accustomed to taking small jobs that I would take these small jobs and then I feel like I would get paid kind of shit for them 
because I just wanted to help somebody out or do somebody a favor or just kind of just just to be active. Because sometimes as an artist, you feel like if I'm not doing something, I'm not working. And it's like kind of like this dumb You're thing. You're being lazy. Yeah, like it's like this dumb thing in my head that's just like, no, you can still work on your stuff. And, you know, so it's like, so there's a few gigs that I've done. I could say may, maybe price wise, like there's gigs that I've done that were like for so little at the time that I was like, man, this isn't even worth it anymore. Like my time to come here to make space for this, to go home, to upload it, to edit like that time isn't worth this hundred dollar or something like that. So it's like learning. I have to like, I had to learn where it's like, okay, I don't feel like, I don't feel like these things are worth it anymore for me. I have to look for something bigger. So it's like, I'm much more selective now, you know, and I'm getting, I've been getting a lot better at pricing myself too, which is like learning to tell people like, you know, I charge this an hour, you know, I charge 200, 250, whatever it is an hour, you know, for the most part, I'm, I'm getting a lot better with just telling people what my price is. Um, there's always still certain people that I work with that, that they pay less, but I, love working with him so like i'll take that small hit like to me it's not a big like if if i don't think it's a big deal i'm the only one who has to who has to care about it so it's like i'm fine with that but for the most part i'm like pretty I, i've gotten a lot better this year with just setting my stuff so you know that the clients you want to take you know the clients you don't want to take um you know you're, you're gonna try and gain more work as you're going along which is never a bad thing yeah, especially yeah. when it's work you want to do yeah, of course but in gaining that work, you were, you know, you were talking about like, hey, I worked with this entertainment company. That's how I got the push. Again. I worked with the Avenue Concept, which protected me from like lawyers to handle this. Mm-hmm. How important is it? Just, just not even just in general, but just in the world of photography. Like, is that normal being represented by other groups? Like, do you need to find a manager? Like, do you need? To, do you? Are you thinking maybe I need to get my own manager, or my own publicist eventually? Like, like how? Like how instrumental has it been joining these other guilds and groups and collectives? Mm-hmm versus doing it on your own so i think so with me i feel like i've always got i've gotten a mixture of both because like when i do my uh, my personal things like you know like if i'm doing like my my book stuff like all that stuff is self-published so it's like that's things that i'm doing on my own when i'm working with these companies you know it's a little bit different because they're representing me so it's like i don't I, I agree i don't have to deal with like the con- i'm not there looking at the contract i have to approve the contract but i'm not there telling them we got to change this we gotta, unless i want to you know what i yep. mean so it's like i i don't think I don't think you have to, but I think in certain moments it could be very beneficial. I think depending on what it is. And I think you could only get that the more you work, the more you keep putting yourself out there. I was going to say, how do you even get involved with these groups? That's just like, put it this way. I've always, so the Avenue concept, literally, they mainly work with like muralists, like people who do murals in, in the city. Cause they yeah, create, I, they I was surprised the when you said the Avenue concept, I'm like, oh, like, you mean the mural people? Yeah, like, I was, yeah, like, was going to so ask like, if I wanted to let you go I've, off. I've and, always wanted to work with them as an artist. I just know that they didn't work with that many photographers like that, unless they're like doing freelance work for them. But that was like a goal of mine back in 2021. I was like, I'm going to work with these people as an actual artist sometime down the line. But I know everything's like kind of, you know, it's all it's all I don't want to say inevitable, but it's all in due time. So it's like I'm working towards my stuff. You know, I've learned to like let life bring stuff to me if I'm continuing to put in the, the effort. And one way that I got in with working with them is because they I used to I mean, I, I do street photography, but I've taken so many photos of the murals throughout the city and I've gotten compliments on it from them. And then one time when one of their main photographer um, when he needed help with something, he was like, Hey, he hit me up. He was like, Hey, I can't do this gig, but I don't know if you'd be able to go to this mural and just take photos of it. You know, this, this is what we pay, blah, blah, blah. He's like, if, um, if you'd be willing to kind of do that for us, this, this, and that. And they got that because they've been seeing my own personal work of doing like just shooting in the city and shooting their stuff in the city. So, so I work with them for like about a year and a half or two, like as just as freelancers. So like, they'd be like, oh, this artist is doing like a mural in downtown. If you could go take photos of them behind the scenes, take portraits of them, and then just like make sure, you know, we have to upload and we have like this, like the schedule and all that stuff. So it wasn't, and then it wasn't until this year when they reached out to me about it. Like they reached out to me, they were like, they hit me up. They was like, hey, we might have something for you to work with us. Like as an artist, reach, um, call me whenever you can. And as soon as I saw that text, I was like, oh shit, we're here. Like I was just like, this is what I've been wanting for a while. And that was pretty much it. She reached out to me and said they had this really big opportunity to like for this stuff in downtown. And it's to the, if I mean, honestly, it's the biggest thing I've ever done. Like realistically, like if we're talking about, it's the biggest thing I've ever done with just like the size of it, the scope and like even like financially and all that stuff. So it, it felt like a huge, huge win for me to work with them, to be represented by them and stuff like that. It was something that I'm very grateful for. Now, I know you were making a joke about this. Or way earlier in the episode where you were you know, asking about your style of photography and then mm-hmm. you said, uh, because I don't like money. Um, <laughs> but I think it, I, I get begs the question and we're on the like kind of on the more business E side of questions of right now, not necessarily a hard separation, but you know, why not 
take the wedding gigs that probably pay a lot. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah I'm, sure. I'm assuming it's a lot, you know, why not take, um, I think they're called maternity. Like when the yeah, mom, like maternity, okay, maternity I, didn't know how to, I didn't know how to call it earlier. Yeah. So I, I, I was like, I'm like, I'm, girl's pregnant I'm, I'm, like I'm, I'm like, I'm like, I think that that's the, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, why not maternity photos? Why not family portraits? And, you know, mm-hmm. especially if it's like for some like rich person out in like Newport or something, they'll probably yeah, pay yeah, like, you, you know, uh, you know, why not take, those things that you know can make more money or um baby photos god that's a huge that's one. a huge market. Yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah why not do those why not why not do those and then it's like hey i'm getting repetitions and maybe make make enough money that i don't have to do the retail job mm-hmm. i don't want to make most of my income from photography if it's photography that i don't care about so i think i think the idea of like only shooting weddings would be horrible because I hate what like for the most part. Uh, and, and not and I'm not saying no, only, oh, no, but no, no, like no, no. hey, I'm, hey, I'm do it like an just to bring the yeah, money yeah, yeah. in. And this is the thing: I still do them in small scale. So like I've done. Oh, okay, okay. This year I've done the most weddings I've ever done in one year, which was like three or four. So like this year, I, I there's like certain portraits that I still take. There's certain things, there's certain gigs that I still take, but it's definitely not like my main thing because I don't. If I do weddings all the time, I'd hate it. If I do certain other gigs, like I don't care for babies. I've done babies in the beginning because you're trying everything. Like I've done a baby shoot before. I just don't care. Like, you know, I just, and, and, and it's like, I don't want to do something. I don't want, if I'm going to go into an art, I don't want to sac- I don't want to just do any, you know, I don't want to do that art in any way that even if I don't like it, I just, because I'm making money, it's good. Like, I don't, I don't want to do that. I'd rather just still try to either maintain this job until I could, able to find like a better solution for it. Cause I'm not even sure if I want to do photography alone as like a main, as a main income. Cause I see myself as an, as like an artist, like right now, photography is the main thing that I'm doing in you know, but I have other plans. Like I have plans for making videos. I have just other things that I have that I know that are in the cards for me. It's just that right now, this is just kind of like the way that I'm like breaking into it, the way that I see it. Now you talk about other things. Mm-hmm. And I think this brings up a, a point of, I've had this conversation with other creatives in different types of fields before. Do you think that because of the way, just the way the world is going, mm-hmm. that, photographers are going to have to do other things besides photography like oh you're gonna have to be a photographer and a video editor like and a color grade person and like you know what i mean yeah, like, I, understand. I think it depends on what you're aiming if you're aiming it to if you want photography to be your main job that you want you know you want to make sure that 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 is what you're getting paid for you're gonna to have to do some shit like you know you might have to like you know dabble into like doing videos or doing other stuff because photography alone is going to be a hard thing Unless, like, you just hone in on some of those really big things. Like, you know, you ever seen some of those big wedding photographers? They get paid so much. Like, I have a friend of mine that does wedding photography. And, like, he doesn't charge less than, like, 3000 3, Like, that's, like, his bare minimum. Like, it's, like, for some of that stuff. So, it's, like, so I think if, you're, if you want it to be your full-time job, you're going to have to figure something else out, I think. Um, but it all kind of depends. Not everybody has the same situation, you know, the same situations. And now, like, with YouTube, there's a lot of photographers that I make money off of their YouTube channels. Um, so it's like it's with is they're making money from photography in a sense because they're discussing photography, but it's not necessarily from their art itself. But that's like a way of you know of doing that as well. So it kind of like depends on how you how you can monetize that, I guess. I uh, I think this leads into you know speaking of ways to monetize. Mm-hmm. Um, why a book? Why 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 just you know I I know that like I've seen photographers work appear in books mm-hmm. and. But it's only like the highest, you know, like like the the top echelon iconic guys. Mm-hmm. Um, but you just decided to do a book, yeah. which I which I thought was cool. Like, yeah, but yeah, like, yeah. what made you want to do that? What made you say, yeah, this is a good idea? And then, what were the steps of like, oh, this is how I want to monetize the book? So yeah. why the book, and and how did you figure out how to monetize it? So I've always wanted, to, like, once I started this, I always wanted to make a book of street photography. I just thought that. I thought that I had to get to a much better place artistically before I could even tackle that. So like I didn't, you know, because I'm so hard on myself, I'm like, you're not there yet. You're not really like there for the book, but eventually it's going to come. And I, once again, I truly trust life that is going to let me know when the time is here. And like 2020 was the first time that I ever felt like, okay, I think I'm, I think like everything's changing for me right now artistically. And I feel like this might be the next route. So it's like, I've always wanted to do that. I think if you're not familiar with the photography, like community and like YouTube and Instagram, you would assume that most of the photography, like mo- only just like certain people do photography books. But if you go on YouTube, like there's so many people that do their own books. Like, so I, I was able to get inspired from other photographers that I admire through YouTube. And there's this photographer from YouTube called Evan Ramp that he's like always been very transparent about his business stuff. Cause he's like more about like showing you how he does the business side of things and stuff like that. And 
he's the first time he did his book, he had this like video of just like how he created his book. And that was a huge help for me. There was another photographer from from London um, named Sean Tucker that he same thing. He has a book and he was like he's talked about how he created it. So it was like, oh, I, I know I can do this as well. So it was like learning how to publish it on your own, do all the work on your own. So it's like. I think there's good money and I love I love seeing my work printed. I think printing your work is extremely, extremely valuable, even if it's just for yourself as an artist. So I think having like one book to show you guys the work that I've been doing, it's it's something that I love and I will never stop doing. Like right now I'm finishing up my zine that I want to finish by the end of this year, by the end of this year. But I have like another Rhode Island book that I'm going to work on next year that I want to be that I, I want to roll it out like in a much bigger way than I did before. So like I want to take it to the next level and kind of just, sh- you know, show what else I'm capable of. So it's like, you know, it's I love having physical books. So I, I just think it's something that I've always wanted to create at that moment. Do you think that there, you know, you're ta- you just said uh, you love seeing your work printed mm-hmm. and, you know, with the way printing capabilities are, you can put a photo on like damn near anything at this point. Yeah, for sure. Um you know the book being one thing but has there been other maybe unexpected ways of making revenue as a photographer that you've recently thought of or that you've seen from somebody else like apparel like i know like in the in the height of streetwear there was a lot of like photo tees like i have a i have a vintage tee from subwear that mm-hmm. it's um a photo from ricky powell um and i wanted it because it's an iconic photo but it's also like just the way it was set up on the tee it was cool mm-hmm but I don't think many photographers are thinking like I can put my photo on a tee and sell it. So maybe some do, some don't. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe some want to put them on like a coaster because it's like a picture of the cityscape or yep. like you, um, you know, uh, you make a postcard, like postcards, like because people aren't getting in the analog stuff again yeah, now. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, so has there been like unexpected <laughs> ways of revenue that you thought of like, oh, I should try that or that you saw somebody else do or mm-hmm. that you think, oh, I didn't know I could make money off my photos doing it this way? I... So clothing is a big thing with me, like in a sense of I always I always envision at some point doing something that represents something like my brand or my work. So it's like that's something that I've always wanted to do in due time. I um, right now I have this. This is this shirt right here that I'm wearing is from like a local street photographer. Um, shout out to Winslow. Um, so like he was doing that stuff at the same time. So I've always loved the idea of like doing that. And then that dude, that that guy, Evan Brand from YouTube. He started like his own clothing stuff, like from his YouTube, from his like photography, like notoriety, basically. So like he was started running that business where he's doing like the clothing and that. So it's like I've always wanted to do that. I just know that that's not something that I could give full attention to right now. But that's definitely something that's like going to start with like just like starting small with like a T-shirt or something like that. So it's like one way you can make money. Um, you know, obviously you have to have some type of like following in, in that in that sense. And um, there's photographers that like sometimes edit other people's things. Like if you're really good at retouching, like really really good at retouching, especially like modeling stuff, like you could you could build a name for yourself just like putting yourself out there to retouch it. Because sometimes there's certain photographers that don't edit their stuff. Like they're just like they'll just send it out because they just need somebody to clean it. And they, they already kind of have this for Paul um, with this person. And then they kind of, because they're making money just from doing the shoots just and not that they're money. like, that's, that's, they, this is going to slow me down. Like give we, it to somebody and, else, whatever. A hundred percent. And then if, and if you, if you have, like, if you know, if you guys could work together on how to even edit, like how you guys have this editing style, then you have no fear and just like, Oh, I'm going to let him do it because I know he's going to do it. He or she is going to do a good right. job. You know what I mean? So it's like, I think learning how to, I think those things, those like other ways of doing it, obviously selling prints too, but that stuff is, you know, once in a blue, but like silent prints is always something that's like really, um, that could be really good as well. And um, nowadays too, I, I know nowadays with social media, like building, like I said, building a brand on social media, like the YouTube thing, I'm going to tackle YouTube pretty hard next year. Like that's like been a, that was, that was a big goal of mine this year that I fall flat on. I, or I fell flat on, like I didn't, I wasn't able to give it the attention that I wanted it to, but I feel pretty confident on where I'm going to be able to take that next year. Um, so I think that could be something that could be able to help me out like financially if I, if I play my cards right, um, with that, but I just, you know, only time will tell in that sense. Speaking of the book, um, which I think is a great idea. I've noticed even on your site, like in the blog section, Mm -hmm. you'll like introduce a series of photos, but there'll be like a story behind them. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a, an interesting paradox there because, you know, they they have that that there's that saying of pictures you know worth a thousand words mm-hmm. or, right, but I find it interesting when I I see a photo and I'll think one thing but then I'll read the description of the story behind it and now it it literally just changes my perception of the photo. Mm-hmm. So, 
but it could change it good or bad. Of course. You know, it, course, could, it, it could change my opinion positively or negatively. There's a lot, there's a lot of photographers. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a lot of photographers that don't that don't like explaining themselves. Or like people usually tell you don't explain yourself. So you just let you, people like interpret it how they want to. So it, it's interesting that you did a book and that you put these stories around the photo. Do you, do you think that putting a story adds con- what are the benefits I guess of putting a story and adding context to a photo? Like what are the benefits but what are some of the drawbacks? I mean the to me the drawback is just that people could people could view it a certain way and then once they see like because it's up to their imagination. So yeah, like you, you ruin you ruin the fantasy in their head by the telling fantasy. them the story. Correct. Yeah. So that's why I try to tell a story, but it's more it's usually visually like I don't always like on my blog I like to talk about like this particular set that I want to show you guys. But like when it comes to like like for example my book my book only had like five words in it like because to me I want the photos to do like all the talking so it's like you know these photos were taken between this time and then like it's all just the images and in the end I just kind of I think I write thank you or something like that so it's like. I like the photos to speak for themselves. I don't, I'm never a big fan. Granted, everybody does whatever they want, but like, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of just like telling people, like sometimes I feel like people sell their photos on Instagram. Like, man, this photo is so important to me. I really want you guys to like this photo because this photo, like, I don't want to hear that. Like, I don't want to, let me see the photo. Like, let me see like what the work is and I'll, and I'll determine how I feel about the photo besides that because I don't, because I, and that's how I feel about my work. I don't want my, I don't want my, you know, my attachment to this photo to just like to draw you in just because I'm attached to the photo. I want you guys to give me your honest opinion and whether it's good or bad, that's what I'm looking for more than like, you know what I mean? I feel like conversely though, if you would have told that crazy lady about like when she had the problem with the state house photo, if you just like leaned into it and been like, oh yeah, it's like, no, this is, this is my, this is my thesis on corruption. Yeah, what you're not yeah, seeing. Yeah, yeah. She, I, 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 yeah, I mean, she may have bought it, bought into yeah, it and been like, yeah, oh, yeah. I'm buying it now. Like, yeah. uh, give me 10, give take me, my money. Yeah, for <laughs> sure. So it's like, I mean, it's all, you know, it's all perspective, you know, and it's all, you have to do things at your, I know, at your pace. I think of, when you talk about the, the clothing stuff, I've been approached to like use my photos for a clothing like two or three times. It's like a very like small local brand reached out to me like, oh, we want to do this, this and that. And it's like, because I plan on doing my own stuff, I don't want to do anything with anybody. Just unless, unless I feel that I really want to work with these people. Like, unless it's like something I'm like, oh man, I really, no, I really want to work with these people. So I would, I would love to do this, but more than likely. I'm just kind of doing, I know I have plans on doing that at some point, so I don't really want to give that to anybody else because I don't really like people having control over like my images like that personally. You know, Instagram started out as like almost like a photography social media app and now it's just... Like, I came in late too. I came in when like it was already yeah. leaving the the photography. Yeah, social. yeah, like, yeah. I and missed like the boat on like being able to grow like organic following and stuff like that. And now, and now it's, it's just fine. like social for social sake. <clears throat> and then Pinterest, I felt like like was like, oh, we'll be the the picture people. And then that went that yeah. way because that could only last so long. It's 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 ca- in a capitalism world. Like. Um, and well, there's a whole other, and I'll I won't go into it now, just because we're getting towards the end of the show. Yeah, but yeah, the good, uh, yeah. I'll show you the article, the inshitification of apps. I've mentioned it on the show before. It's 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 fascinating. But um. The reason why I mentioned those things, like, there's that, right? Moo didn't always exist as a business. Like, the fact that you can just, like, take an image and, like, print on business cards and get those, like, within a couple of days. You know, um, you were talking about that printing service that you had to go to in Canada. Now, like, there's so many online services where it's, like, send us your picture and, like, you know... For, for, I mean, for crying out loud, Google Photos, like, hey, do you want prints? We'll send them to you overnight, like, with it, and Crazy. it's only this much money. Yeah, yeah, they make it so much easier. What... What is your opinion on how technology and or if you want to do it in one answer, or if you want to separate them, it's up to you. Technology and or social media. What do you, what is the effect on not just how you work in photography, but how photography is perceived? Like with social media? Well, with social media, but then I guess also how is technology <laughs> affected as well? Because again, like you can now like, you know, magic, like ma- on your phone, you can use magic eraser and like, and it'll auto fill the background. It's like, it's, we can, yeah. we can now create fantasy, yeah, like yeah. things that aren't there very easily. So how, how is technology and social media affected photography in your opinion? I think in good and bad ways. I mean, there's a lot of bad things about, I mean, Hey, Hey, let's go into both. Yeah. 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 So like, there's a lot of things that I don't like, you know, that I hate about Instagram. I hate the way the algorithm is now. I hate how everything is done for like reels compared to like i know at one point people were actually able to grow their stuff organically through instagram and it's not the case anymore so it's like you know i could i could see the negative and all that i hate there's so much of it that i hate sometimes like I, sometimes scrolling through instagram de- like removes my motivation like sometimes i'm just like i'm looking through the same shit all the time it's not until i have to grab myself like yo bro you're doing too much slow it down put that phone away like so it's like i don't like so that's a that's like a bad part of it, but I think the good part is that it's a way to share your work. Like I could share on Instagram all I want, but that's where the majority of my followers know me from is Instagram. So without that platform, 
who knows if I would have been able to, you know, be a lot more bolder. Because back then, if you wanted to put your work out there, you had to be like, yo, I'm doing a gallery. Come to this gallery. Come see my work. Like, you had to be really fucking bold back then to, like, really put yourself out. That's why there were so many, sele- you know, they were much more selective with that, which makes sense. Right. But with social media, everybody could do it. So it's like, there's, like, that good and bad thing of it, I think. Um, and I, I don't know. I feel like I've been able to benefit benefit from it but i i'm and i'm in a moment where i'm just trying to like wean people like off of just going to social media for my work it's like kind of have to get my website a little bit better i haven't updated my website we spoke about it earlier but i haven't updated my website in months so it's like it's it's like learning how to kind of just like get that a little bit better for myself and then like and then if you talk about if you talk about like being able to yeah like being able to print everyone has an like an iphone or android now that can take really good photos but even like when you said about the whole printing thing through google like there's easier ways to do it now and because of that i've been able to flourish from it so like i print my own stuff like through a through a website it's called printique.com i always tell photographers if you guys ever need help with it please reach out because i've done so many mistakes that i could help you save some money but it's like that like to be able to do that on my own to be able to just go and get something printed out and then put it on a frame myself that's a whole different type of ball game than having to go through like all this other steps that people used to go through in the nineties to get their shit printed. So I think more than not, like there's much better things for us to be able to take advantage of. It's just how you end up utilizing it in the end. I think because you could just get caught up in, you know, right now everything's real. So you could get caught up in like, even the technology is just like, Oh, this isn't like for me. It's, but it's like the, the platform isn't your platform. Like you can't, you can only get so upset when at the idea you don't own Instagram. This is just like a tool that you use to get your work out there. Now you might have to find another tool to like kind of like do certain things so that makes sense that makes sense yeah, yeah, makes, yeah, sense. yeah, yeah. makes sense you know there are certain types of i guess artistic mediums or certain um platforms where it's like hey you have to go to this particular city not even like a city just this particular city mm-hmm. you know comedy you hear about like la new york chicago mm-hmm. like certain cities are known for that um can like also certain cities in canada, canada get, yeah, like yeah, you know because like all those great people i mean yeah like, we, we've imported so many yeah, comedi- oh great comedians from canada Fucking great i mean S- i mean sc if you uh, Anybody who wants to go a fun valley, like look up an old TV show called SCTV. It was basically Canadian Saturday Night Live, but oh, like, but dope. like the roster on that show was like just Crazy. murderers. Or like John Candy came from that. Rick Moranis yeah, came from yeah, that. Like cool. so many like legendary people. But um, with that being said, like you know you hear about you hear about like oh you got to move here, you got to do this, you got to be in the city, and I think the internet and social media has changed that Completely a lot. Changed. That's why it's you could just come to your work just by pressing on a button. What made you? And maybe this plans have changed, mm-hmm. um, but what has made you stay in Providence so far? Why why stay here instead of going to a bigger city and like having maybe having more? In- I'm not saying the subject will be more interesting, but make, you know having more of a playground to work with. Mm-hmm. Um, why stay here? Uh, I love Providence, and it's like where I'm it's where I'm from. So it's like to me, I want to make a name. I want to keep making an impact out here. Um, I'll tell you this much though: I am not just looking to only get big in Providence. So like to me. I have my sights set on other things. And this year I've been able to do that because I told myself I was going to travel a lot more this year for street photography. And that's exactly what I did. I've like traveled to different States and different places this year. I just got back from New Orleans like about a week and a half ago. Cause I was out there just shooting, doing street photography. And it's like money that I'm putting up myself, but it's like, I'm going to be able to hopefully find ways to monetize that. Cause the zine, like I'm going to start, I'm doing this, like this zine on like places that I do out of Rhode Island. So it's like I'm I'm releasing my first one this this um this month and it's like with my work from New York, Boston, you know, my work from DC that I went to last year. So it's like I think I want to keep reaching out as much as I can basically, but I want to I still enjoy staying here cuz I'm like in a good place where it's like I go to Boston, I could go to New York, I go to certain, you know what I mean? Like I could, I could go to certain places like that. So it's like I I haven't really thought of moving out anytime soon, but I do think I do think at some point in the future I will be end up moving somewhere else. Um, but it's all like I, everything is in due time. I'm like more focused on where I'm at right now. What do you think makes Providence unique, positive and negative from mm-hmm. the type of work, like for the type of work that you do? Well, the negative part is that Providence is just, you know, it's not known like that. So it's, you go somewhere else, they might not know what, what Providence is. They might, you know, depending uh, on oh, Long, Long Island. Island. It's like, yeah, oh, yeah. God damn it. So it's like, it, <laughs> In that sense, it might be a little bit more difficult for people to get known out here, you know, um, out of out of the state, at least. Yeah. Um, the beauty behind that, though, is that because it's so small, you could be a big fish in a small pond. So it's like I made a lot of wave in here within the last five years. And I think because it's such a small place, you know, if you're making loud enough noises, like you'll be able to get seen a little bit more. So it's 
I think that's a huge advantage to even being able to kind of be more dominant out here compared to being dominant in some place in New York where it's just so much more difficult. There's so many more. There's so many fucking photographers. Every time I was just in New York, I went to SantaCon in New York this weekend. I'm not sure if you're familiar with SantaCon. Oh, I know. I know what it is. Yeah, yeah. So like me, I went up. I've been wanting to shoot that forever. So like me and my, I went, I pulled up the day before Friday night and I met up with my friend Winslow. We shot in Times Square. And next day we went back to Times Square to shoot SantaCon. And it's like, that stuff is, you know, that's just, it's a whole nother playing field. Like it is a fucking, when you're in New York, there's so much shit going on. And then the amount of photographers that you meet out there. So many of them are excellent. So many of them have already so established. They have their, you know, they have their whole brand. They have their books and all this stuff. But it's like, I enjoy being able to go there and people are like, oh, you're from Providence. Oh, this work is from Providence. Oh, wow. This looks like I would have never thought or something like that. So it's, I, I think that there's an advantage for me being here, you know, um, and I'm grateful. And I love embracing the city. I, I fucking love the city. I, I think I've, I started doing art in a time where like the city was like continuing to bubble from like everything that it's been doing. Like I think of the shit with Stay Silent where it's like, They've been doing stuff for so long. And like, I mean, what? I think Wednesday night is the, you know, what, by the time people hear this, it, it may be past tense, but they're doing their documentary. Funny enough, they're doing yeah, their documentary yeah, at the Columbus yeah, Theater. Yeah, yep, yep. So it's like it's what they've been doing has been fucking a and that's, legendary. That's ten year, and that's 10 years in the making. A though. legendary run, man. Like, I am grateful to be alive to see that happen and unfold. And, and I'm grateful to have been a part of it at some point. Hey, I was, I was grateful know? to interview Jay and Sabrina just to yeah, talk man. about the story of that of course, whole thing. Of course, hell yeah, man. So it's just like, I think it's dope that we have that. And I think we could go somewhere and like keep our, you know, stand up a little bit taller and keep our heads high to just make sure you're, you're representing properly from next area. Cause I, I, I love how small Providence is. If I'm being honest with you, I go to other cities and it's cool. And I was in New York and it was as packed as you can imagine this weekend. Cause the weather was like 55 degrees, Santa Con and it's holiday weekend. But then when I come back to Providence, it's like quietness. It's like, man, this is fucking nice. Like I would hate to be, I would hate to go out and like, just like kind of live in New York like that personally. But I enjoy like visiting and stuff like that. You had said, you know, uh, really quick, we were talking about like the ease of what you can do nowadays with technology that, yeah, you've, I've made some mistakes. I, uh, and I want to help people, mm-hmm. you know, not make those same mistakes and save some money and mm-hmm. maybe save some part of their sanity too. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so that brings up this question, you know, if you could go back in time, like what advice would you give a just getting started version of you or what advice would you give if somebody hears this episode of sees you working like, Hey, I want to do that. I, I always thought that the most important thing, like, f- like depending on what you're going for, but if you were like me that I just wanted to be better, it's just focus on your work and everything else is like secondary. Like it's your camera doesn't matter. Your, it matters to an extent, but if you're beginning, your camera doesn't matter. <laughs> like, so it's like, I think if you just focus on your work and eventually you'll be able to figure that out. But it, you know, I, I, to me, that was the most important thing that once I, once that clicked with me, it just changed the way I tackle things. Cause I would wake up and everything would always be such like a, a hurdle. Like I have to post this. What if people don't like this? So I'm going to post this and I want to do this. And, and it's just like, I had to learn to stop caring so much. And as long as I appreciate the work, that's what matters. And that made me, you know, be way better as a photographer. So if you're just looking to focus on like to get better as an artist, please just focus on your work. Everything else will come secondary. Um, that's the way that I, that's, that was what was really helpful for me. We're at the end of the show <laughs> and uh, I stole this. I, I, I'm going to keep saying it because I want to be transparent. I yeah, be yeah. Like, you live to death. Stole this idea from Hot Ones, but we didn't have to eat Hot Wings. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether you consider that luckily or not luckily is up to you. Yep, yep. Um, but at the end, as, as this tradition on this show, uh, I give the person being interviewed open platform to say, promote, whatever you want just know that if you promote something time sensitive it may not line up <laughs> so do with that what you will but other than that uh you know we're at the end the, f- the floor is yours so feel free you know hot mic like say whatever you want uh to promote and, um it doesn't have to be for promotion, promotion. it could be yeah. wherever you want well, to promote i will say this i am releasing a zine at the end of this month for the work that I've done out of Providence. Well, the month is December, December 2023. 20, so in case you're, you're absolutely right. So in you're case you're listening right. yeah, to yeah, this yeah, a year from now. Right. So at the end of this month, yeah, at the end of this month, 2023, December, I will be releasing a zine that shows off the work that I've done out of Providence. So that's something that you should definitely be on the lookout for. I'm really, I'm really excited to show you all the different types of, of images that I've been able to capture around the country. Um, and besides that, that's like the biggest... I feel like that's all I would have right now. Right now, I'm like in this. Yeah, I feel like that's 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 all I would have right now. I'm I'm grateful to be here, man. I'm grateful for the opportunity. 
thank you for coming letting me you know interviewing me for this um it's cool to be the 50th episode too so number, I'm, yeah I, I yeah like, yeah, like, yeah he's man gonna, like, he's gonna be number 50 when you told like, me that when you crap, told me that dude. i think we're that true you're like you're gonna be 50 i was like oh like, yeah shit. no pressure man <laughs> but, uh, but that's the whole thing that's like you know everything's in due time you know what i mean like we could have there's no rushing it's like oh we're, we're oh we'll do it at some point i think we spoke about it back when you came to oh, calling yeah Club like we were just like, like all right we're trying to figure yeah, this out yeah, and back then, like, in june life happened yeah <laughs> so it's like it's honestly i'm I'm happy when i you know the way it happened so we got it done so with but, that with that we're ending we're ending the show we're ending episode 50 episode 50 with uh with you know the person the person documenting the visuals of providence <laughs> and the guy documenting the stories of, from an audio standpoint yes, of providence yes, amazing and now slightly video <laughs> yep, i'm just yep, not yep. in them i'm, I'm not, just not in them it, man. you're sure. doing it you're doing it i'm uh, making sure it. i'm not in them it's not my story yeah. it's yours Event- eventually he'll be in them just give him some time like give him some time <laughs> don't like, please please don't do that yeah. now, now people are gonna pressure me into it it's gonna be weird <laughs> yeah. <sighs> of course, of course, we could we couldn't end the episode fifty without something had. Yeah, Thank, yeah, thanks, yeah, Robbie. Yeah, thanks, thanks so much. Hey, it'll be good for you, man. <laughs> <laughs> you'll see, you'll see. And, we, and, we, and we still got to do that shoot too. Oh okay, yeah, oh, yeah. Just not because I've been exhausted. No, I know, no, 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 a hundred percent not today. Uh, but uh, we still have to do that shoot. So. With that being said, before we go off on another tangent, that doesn't make any damn <laughs> sense. That'll be that'll be for the uh, eventual Patreon, ladies and gentlemen. But uh, ladies and gentlemen, they them. However you identify, it's all good. It's all love here. We, we all we all love. Spread love. It's the PVD way to quote Jane Sabrina and stay silent. But with that. Episode 50 is done with Rafael Medina. Thank yes. you so much. And as I have ended uh, almost damn near every episode, and I think it's really poignant to end on this one, and I think Rafael would agree. No matter what you're doing out there, folks, keep on creating. Yes.